Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MotorAge TST webcast, Enhancing Your AC Diagnostics. Uh, of course, I'm here with my good friend, G. Trulia, president of TST and ATTS. How's it going, buddy? Pete, good to have you back, oh, brother. Oh, that's oh. right. I got my card. I'm so, I'm that's good. Right. You're I'm a card-carrying man. <laughs> well, um, it's been a while, Pete. It has. I'm glad to have you back up here. It has. The boys are back in town. We're back in town. We are here. <laughs> and thank you for being here, everyone. Yeah, we, we do appreciate show it. for you tonight. We do. We do. Tonight's topic is enhancing your AC diagnostics. As I said, uh, tonight is brought to you by our good friends at Mitchell One, uh, makers, of course, of Pro Demand. And a lot of us know Pro Demand for their service information, but that's not the only suite of software that they offer. I mean, they have the complete Correct. package to help you manage your shop, customer contacts, invoice records, workflow, you name it. So by all means, let them know that you appreciate them uh, sponsoring tonight so we could bring this information to you and go check them out at www.mitchell1.com. Real good stuff. We use it here. Here's just some of the things we're going to try to talk about tonight, try to squeeze it in. Number one, performance testing. We're going to look at the ways that we've been performance testing AC systems over time and see if we can help you decide which one is the one for you to help you isolate and locate problems with today's modern and complex air conditioning systems. We're going to take a look at mating temperature readings with your pressure gauges. Something called an enthalpy chart we're going to be getting into tonight. No, I didn't say empathy. I said enthalpy. And I got to tell you, I've never heard of that. And I got to give props to Jim Kokonis over at CTI, CarQuest Technical Institute. Uh, he works in the research development there. And he actually brought this to our attention um, a while back. Yeah. Kind of caught my eye. And he's got an article, great article that he wrote for us. It'll be in the June issue. So if you want more information on exactly what this is, be on the lookout for that. Next thing we're going to talk about, why a scan tool may be the first tool you need for your diagnostics, especially when we're dealing with complex multi-zone automatic climate control systems. Often the problem may be just a sensor and have nothing to do with the refrigerant circuit. And, you know, with today's complex vehicle, Pete, that is super important to use the scan tool to go in there and see if there's a problem. Something may be shutting the AC off. Absolutely. Including the cooling system problem. Absolutely. And essential checks that you might not be making, especially with the new R1234YF, the importance of finding all the leaks in the system when they come into your shop. And, of course, we will, of course, hit on best practices, as we, as we always do, because they are more important now than ever when it comes to AC repair. And, and let's give them a warning here. You know, R1234YF, Pete, as you know, is flammable. And it's also expensive, 70 bucks or so a pound, depending where you're at. And if it leaks, even though the systems don't take a lot, it could be 16 ounces, one pound, they give you a little over, a little less. Bottom line is that's 70 bucks you're letting in the air. So yes. we're going to show them some neat ways of avoiding the stuff leaking in the air and how to test for this leak. Absolutely. All right, just a little homework here first. If you haven't already figured it out, when you're watching on the MotorAge training account page first, you may have to back up a step to where you launch the course in order to access your handout. If you haven't already downloaded it, it is available for you there. If you haven't downloaded it yet, you can back up, come back in, or take care of it when you uh, exit the, uh, enter the yeah, finish the webcast, of, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, blah. <laughs> just get a piece of paper and yes. write down and you'll be ready to roll. Yeah, absolutely. Just write it down. But right below the player window, you're going to see this teeny little kind of a chat function. It almost looks like it's disappearing behind the player. And three little dots over to the right. Click on those three little dots. And you'll get this little box here that gives you the choice to pop it out. And when you do that, you'll see this. And you can set that little chat box off to one side to make it convenient for you. Set your player where you want it and get nice and comfortable. Now, the chat box is for all you guys and gals to have your fun and intermix and share your stories and comments and say howdy to each other. If you want to ask a question of us, though, during the course of the webcast, look at the bottom and you'll see Ask a Question. That's going to take you to a Q&A box where you will type in your question. It'll show up here. And after we have a few collected, our buddy Pierre, VP of TSC, behind the scenes there, 
will uh, pop it out for us and share. we'll be able to share that on the screen with everyone and we'll handle those questions in a group every now and then during the course of the webcast. And of course, I gotta make sure I give props to Ms. Julia Doreen, who's always here taking care of the camera action and making sure that everything runs smoothly and we don't get too far out of hand or stay around too late. That's right. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Testing AC system performance, good, better, or best. If you start off an AC business for any length of time, or you can still look it up now in your service information system, you're going to find that typically they're going to tell you that you must prepare the vehicle in a specified way prior to the test. And this is good practice, a yeah, real good practice to actually do this. Yes, absolutely. Because, and we, as we'll show you later on, it does make a difference. So step number one, are the doors and windows open or closed? Is the hood open or closed? Is the engine supposed to be at operating temperature? Are we going to run it at max AC or some other combination of controls in the system? What does the blower speed have to be on? High or low or something in between? And if it's a variable compressor, what setting is a variable compressor need to be set at if specified? Step two, we have to measure the outlet temperature at the center duct, but what are you going to use for that, G? Well, you know, Pete, People have been doing things for years. Sometimes they do it wrong. And the little thermometer it may be using, especially those little thin ones, they could fall out. And sometimes people tend to put them in the left side duct. As it says here, the center or right side is usually colder. Why? Here's why. Okay, rather than just talking to him, I'm talking <laughs> to you. Here's why. It's the evaporator is in either the central location or to the right that's why it's going to be colder there and how do you get the coldest temperature you know you got all this to go through but how do you get your coldest temperature if you wanted to show a customer low speed fan absolutely max. absolutely people make that mistake all the time so yeah. now yeah. notice we also listed that you can use an infrared temperature gun like the ones that they are popping on your head when you walk into the store or the doctor's office to make sure you're not carrying any or even here we had to pop your head yeah new york requirement right every right. time we walk in the building i gotta get my temperature checked <laughs> but that you can use at the duct and that'll give you an idea of the temperature coming out and of course if you're on if you own a thermal imaging camera you can use it for that and a lot more as we will take a look at a little later on right. we'll be using it now we're going to try this little test out on my beast. If you really, I'm not going to get into the whole story of how I ended up with this thing. <laughs> but I am the proud owner, owner of an F350 dually. And yes, it's got the Sicko or Sixo, right? Sicko is probably a lot of what you guys are thinking, diesel engine in it. But this is our guinea pig for the first part of the webcast so we can go through these different test procedures and make up our minds of what the good, better, and best might be. So we're going to go ahead and follow the Ford specifications for setting up the vehicle. In this case, engines brought to normal operating temperature. And just a side note there, because we all do this when we're checking for a customer's complaint on air conditioning, or we just want to see how it's, how it's working. We get the car started out in the parking lot on our way to coming into the shop. We run the blower through all four modes to make sure that's working. We test all the different doors to make sure they're changing. That's a great time to do that. Verify the mode door operation. That is, you bring an important part up here, Pete. Over the years, being in business, I've had a lot of people come in and actually say, hey, my air condition's not working. Well, the refrigerant part's working. What's not working is where does the air default to? The windshield. So we may have a problem that air is not coming out of the panel duct. And where this guy lives, it's hot down there. He's in <laughs> Florida. Okay, we get nasty up here. Like today is pretty nasty, 80 some odd degrees and humidity pretty high, but nothing compared to you. If that air is not coming out of your panel duct and it's coming out of the, either the floor or, again, the, goes to the defrost as a default, people are going to think they don't have AC. Yeah. Very important to do the steps he said. Listen to the fan. You know, I always say the brain, eyes, ears, nose, hands, very important. Listen, look, feel, and know what's going on. Absolutely. Very important stuff to do. Absolutely. And I've actually had customers who may have just gotten a new vehicle or another vehicle they're not familiar they with the operation say. and they complain that it's not working right and they just don't have the, the system set up for that maximum right. pulling effort. Didn't right? we just see Doreen in a Porsche? Yeah. We had no clue. We had to tell her what to do. Yeah, shady <laughs> moments of the movie Risky Business, right? Ready to <laughs> exactly. take it off the dock. 
All right, so next up for us is to set the temperature set to full cold. Blower is set to high. Look at this, guys. The research door open. Okay, now, why the, would they think that? Why would that have to be open, Pete? Yeah, it's like, but it's kind of it's kind of unusual, right? It's research door open. Why would that be? I think I have a good uh, idea. Go ahead. Not so unusual. Where you are, or in Phoenix, Arizona, it's going to be hotter in your vehicle. You need some air coming in and pull the hot air out. If you're just on research in there, you're going to have a problem. So you want that door open. To get yeah. some of it out. Some people even crack the windows down first to get heat out. Yeah. And then under the test mode, another reason for that research door open, we want to stress that AC system. We want to get that refrigerant to see just how much it can do and whether it's going to do its full job. Right. And, and just going along with that, as you mentioned, open all windows, leave the hood open. And in my case with the super cab, I also have to open up the rear doors. Right. And what and we're doing is just letting all that hot, humid, Florida ah. air Stop. Inside the cab. Stop. Stop. It's real bad. <laughs> but, you know, a good thing, Pete, here to also say is, you know, people think air conditioning systems like a block of ice blowing cold air. As It's not. What does it do? Hot goes to cold, the principles of uh, thermo, right? And it's what's going to happen is the hot air in a car has to go and boil the liquid low-pressure refrigerant, okay, to remove that heat. Right. And if we have a problem, now we just had one recently on his doctor's car. He was complaining his AC wasn't working. One thing we all need to look for is the leaks. Not on the Pete's feet. We're talking about under the car, right? Because if we don't have a leak under the car, what do we have, Pete? And this yeah. doctor had a problem. The drain tube was clogged, and he was not getting cold in there. Mm -hmm. And this brings in mold, mildew, and yep. no cooling. Yep. No cooling. So you always have to make sure we got a leak under the car. If it ain't leaking, you got a problem. Okay. Further on with the test conditions for the Ford, here next we're going to record ambient temperature. And we're going to take a look at that as we go through this. You know, when I was first taught how to work on AC, I was always told that you should record the air in front of the condenser. Maybe not. And we'll do that. We'll see as we go along what I mean by that. Then we're going to go ahead and let the vehicle run, and we're going to let the temperature and pressures stabilize. We're going to record the discharge pressure, the high side pressure. We're going to record suction, the low side pressure. And then we're going to get that old service information chart the factory provides to determine if those pressures are in the normal range. Now, here's what I got with the gauge readings after about 10 minutes of running in the shop. 42 PSI on the low side. 325 PSI on the high side. Now, I got to stop you, Pete, because this makes a big difference. How hot was it in the shop? Oh, I think I got that here, too. Here you go. Ambient there temperature is 93.7 degrees in my shop. Let me get the holy water out. You can keep that in Florida. And the relative humidity was actually a good day in Florida. It was only 54%. For me, that's like being in the tropics. Oh, Beautiful okay. weather. Beautiful oh weather. God. That's too okay. much for me. And notice what we got out of the center duct. But before we do that, I want to go one back one more. 325 PSI, that's kind of high. That looks a little high. 42, yeah, maybe, but still maybe a little bit on the high side. When I would, If I was just going to look at this. Looks like almost like an overcharge. Kind of does, doesn't it? Kind of does, kind of does. So we're going to look at here. We've got 93 inside, 74 at the center. What is that? About a 19 degree difference, 20 degree and, difference? And we want a 30 degree difference, is where you get Do we? Yeah. I have a surprise for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All okay, right. Do we so, have a question, Pierre? Uh, yes, we do. All right. So we have a question. Is, where do you find those test conditions? Um, you know, where you, you can push the button and put it on the screen, buddy. Hit answer. <laughs> it's new technology, guys. Okay. There we go. Look at that, huh? Oh. Is that slick, guys? What or what? Yeah. So, was that Marty? He's asking, where do you find the test condition set up for functional tests on different manufacturers? You go to the service information system and you look up AC system performance diagnosis, and it should give it to you. And I'll give you a tip. There's yeah. Carl looked up the other day. It had two. It had one for retail, and then it had one for the rest of us. Oh. So be careful about which one you're looking at. Exactly. But that's exactly where you find it. And in fact, when we move to the vehicle here in the shop, we'll be able to show you that actually in 
the Pro Demand Service Information System. So thank you very much for that question. Good question. So here are the charts that we're referring to. Now, Ford lists two to go by, and it's based on ambient temp and relative humidity. In this case, this chart is for 70 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So I fit in there, and relative humidity, 30 to 60%. Remember, I had 54. So this is the chart I want to use, and now we're going to plot them out. Here's the discharge pressure, and here's the low side pressure on the actual charts. Notice that the high side pressure is just a little outside of the range, while the low side pressure is just a little under the range. The range. Would you condemn this vehicle as having a problem, or is that just, just enough to not worry about? Well, you know, it all depends on the customer's complaint. Right. That's the biggie. If they're not happy, you may want to play with this. Well, remember the temperature difference that we talked about? Only 21 degrees, about 20 degrees. So, it, like, and I agree with you. I'd like to see more than that, Yeah. depending on the conditions. But we'll get into right. more of that in a bit. And the color inside the vehicle, it's sitting in the sun, the whole bit. Absolutely. It makes a big difference. But then again, what is very common with manufacturers is that once you have that information and you have the pressure readings, they give you one of these charts, and we've all seen them. High side, low side columns. Is that high and high? Then here's what they think you should check for the problem if it's low and low, and so on. So this is kind of like a, a, a menu list menu. Where, where we would we were fit. We're a little high on the high, a little low on the low. Maybe here, and again, engine overheating could be a possibility. Hmm. That might come up to play in a little bit. Yep. Where else we got here? Maybe uh, normal to high and normal. Overcharge, we're kind of looking at that too with those pressures. Yeah. So this is where we're going right now. So is this a good testing method? I don't know. Let's do a little comparison here. What difference does it make if I have the doors open or doors closed, for example? Making it work harder here. Yeah, notice here we've got some pretty high readings still. On like, as We had the 325 PSI on the high side. Now we're getting down about 225. Little drop in the low side. And by the way, this drop right there in that low side is telling you you're going to be pretty cool in that car. Getting a little bit cooler, yep. But what I want to point out here is while I was doing this comparison, now the vehicle had been running for a little while, getting warmer in the shop. The gauge reading started running around quite a bit. I mean, going all over the place. And these are kind of like the highest and lowest ranges that I saw during that case. And I'm asking myself, what is causing this? Well, I'll get back up. How many of you remember how the Ford had an electric, uh, electronically controlled fan clutch? Oh, yeah. That the PCM could control the viscosity in the clutch and speed it up or slow it down accordingly. And you could hear the fan blowing harder. And when the fan kicked in, so to speak, the pressure started to drop. It was reacting to that high side pressure getting a little too high, a little too high. Right. See, now that's the normal things that people don't think about is, you know, when I do an air conditioning class, I say, hey, we need to look at the heating side and in the engine side, because if that ain't working right, if you got a slip and belt, bad fan, fan shroud missing, all that stuff can give you unbelievable problems in AC. Sometimes right. even turn the AC system off. Right. And that's what you got to look at. Because your, your high side goes a little higher than that three something. It's yeah, it, it got up to 350, as I you see can see right in there. that image. So that's a little higher than what we want to see it. But another thing we want to stress here, too, is that when you're performing these tests, you're doing your visual inspection first. Does it look like you've got good, clean airflow through the condenser? Are the fans working as they should? Are all the panels that are underneath the car and supposed to be inserted on the radiator on either side, are they still there? Today's vehicles are designed very critically when it comes to airflow over that condenser and if you leave these panels off or you put that new radiator in and you don't put the foam inserts and the, and the air ducts back in place or there's a problem like in the camaro with an active grill shutter that's closed and won't open all of these are things that can affect your readings so just remember sure you keep those in mind no doubt you know again you got to look at the whole system the whole system if we have like down your way you have loads of bugs if we have a lot of bugs on the condenser, years back, we were able to rake the condenser with special rakes. Yes. Can't do that now. Nope. And do not hit it with pressure water because you'll bend the fins. 
you know, a light vacuum with a brush is what we try to do if you can get in there. A lot of times you can't. Look for leaks. Like how about if you have an oil cooler or a tranny cooler or something mounted in front of it and it's leaking and covering it, a plastic bag. I mean, these are all things that have come yes. into my shop here and we've had issues with. And like you said, the air dams. Yep. You know how many people, especially if they go to a quick lube place, they go, boop, 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 they take it off because next time they don't want to do that. What happened to the aerodynamics and what happened to the cooling that's going to come up there? Absolutely. It's a big difference. Absolutely. Um, and the other point I want to bring out, well, you just remember that, well, you were just uh, talking about that. I can't think right now. If I do, I'll come back to it in a moment. So here we're going to take a look at the temperature differences now between the doors open and the doors closed. Doors open, 93 and 74. So again, right about 20 degrees. Doors closed, 98, 78. Not much of a change. Not much of a change. No, not much at all. Okay. Hmm. Let's keep that in mind as we go along. Now, what happens if I close the research door? Now I've got the doors closed and I've got now I've added the research door is closed. Here's the difference. Research door open. Your about 42, about 325, like we had before. But and look what happens with the research door 30 closed. And 200, you're gonna be cold. Yeah, now we're getting cold. Super cold. Here's the temperature difference. Research door open. Again, there's about that 20 degree variance, but now look. Temperature in the shop's gotten to 100 degrees, 101, but the stuff, air coming out of the ducts is 57. Over 30, there you go. That's a huge difference, isn't it? Huge. 43, 44 degrees difference. Because you were pulling in too much hot air into that system. Oh, wow. How many of you guys figured that out too, right? Or thought about that right away? Well, you got to get the G-Man been around so long. I knew he would like to stop right on top of that, but. That's the difference. Where is the evaporator getting its air from? What's the temperature of the air getting to the evaporator? Super important. Absolutely. When the fresh air door was open, it's pulling in that 100 degree Florida heavily humid air. But then once the door is closed, the cab's closed up, and we've Suck given it a few minutes to stabilize. There you go. Now that cool air going in or is a lot, well, that air going into the evaporator case is being pulled in is a lot cooler than it was, how, right? How long were you running it? About five minutes. Door, before the door, uh, you close it. Yeah, about five minutes between the two. Yeah, so you had a lot of hot air in there and you needed to sure. move it out. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So that bears up the question, how cold is cold enough? And what I want to make the point of with these past few slides it all depends on how you are setting up the vehicle for that performance test. I always, I didn't care what it said in the book, and I just kind of got away from that. I always set it up to max cool. Doors closed, research door closed, and then I was looking just like we saw, you know, like a 40 degree difference or so in temperature between yeah, I ambient mean, and inside. We don't look it up here. We play, we look for the 30 degree because you don't have airflow coming in the shop. Right. I mean, we got air conditioning here, but. You're looking for that 30 degree difference. If it does that, it's good, but you need to have a game plan of what are you going to do on the recall? Right. And can you go to that research door? Like you said, you know, we've had people come in and someone borrowed their car. This happens to a lot of old people, especially with a Euro car. Someone borrowed this Mercedes or BMW, and it's not super intuitive what buttons you press. Now, all of a sudden, their air conditioning they think is not working mm -hmm. because it's not there. Their niece or someone, the, the, the instance Change I'll bring it. up, yeah. changed it. You got yeah. to be aware of it. Now, here's something I really want you to pay attention to in the next few slides. It all depends, as I said, is where that comparison and measurement is taking. When we did the outside air, the fresh air doors open, and we compared to the outside air outside of the truck, we got that 20-degree drop. But if I compare now the air with the research door closed to the air that was entering the evaporator, which is now, as far as the evaporator is concerned, is ambient, it's about the same amount of drop, which is telling me the efficiency of the refrigerant circuit is able to pull that 20 degrees out of the air no matter what the temperature was when it went in. Of course, now we got down to 40 below. That might be a different story. But... This is not an unusual range on late model cars. Right. Okay. It all depends on where you're taking that ambient temperature reading. 
And, you know, you bring something up. You just mentioned 40 below. So if the vehicle system thinks it's 40 below, you're not getting any air conditioning. No. Oh. So that's another thing. If it thinks you're overheating, you ain't getting any air conditioning. Okay. Right. These are things, you know, like load shedding for electrical stuff. Well, this is going to be the same in air conditioning. We need to look at sensor data, not only for the AC system, but for the engine cooling system again. Absolutely. It's a big thing that really messes Absolutely. people up. And again, That's this is just another slide that just shows, again, the difference. If I'm comparing it to the outside, what we would normally do, measuring at the condenser or wherever you have it outside the vehicle, we would have been really impressed with that 44-degree drop in, in, in temperature. But the reality is it's about the same whether that research door was closed or open. It all depends on what the air temperature is actually getting to the evaporator. Okay. Later models can be as little as 20 degrees and be fine, according to the OEM. And that's the most you're going to get out of them, okay? Well, you know, what they say is normal, again, is just like oil burning in 500 miles. Yeah. Is normal for them, so they don't get things back right. in their shop. Right. The reality is I've been out in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's been, you know, in the 100 teen area. And you're lucky if you get 70 something out of the out of duck of the AC system. Yeah. But and think, that's cool. But, it's but yeah, but good. think about it. If it's 110 degrees outside the car, then that's not too much bad of a drop. But no. what's the air getting to the evaporator? Yeah. Right. Right? What's that's, the variance there? And that's what we're referring to is that at, at the evaporator. However, older vehicles like G Man was talking about, 30 degree or better is what we really want to see. And there's a different refrigerant. Let's talk about, you know, R12 was a minus 21.7 mm. degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, when you go to R134A, it's a minus 15.4. And now when you go back to our new stuff that we're going to be using, you're a minus 22 degrees. Mm. So the, mm. the refrigerant itself, what it can do, it's when it could boil and stuff, completely different. And that's right. why this new refrigerant is very, very good in comparison to 134A. And then, by the way, I want to bring this up, too. Some people think they can retrofit. They can put 134A in this. There's no retrofitting no. in a 1234YF car at all. No, no. And we're, gonna, and we're going to hit on that a little bit later on, too, as well, because you can guarantee, I'll guarantee you that some good a boy is going to try exactly that when his AC system ain't working right. Do we have another question? They've already done it. All right. Question from Kent. Are you usually seeing less pressure differential on cars with automatic climate control. That's a great Very question. question. Again, you want to take a look at what the test conditions that the manufacturer specifies for this particular test. What I want you to do is I want you to compare that to the air that's actually getting to the evaporator. If the doors have to be open, then take your ambient measurement down around the floorboard near where, they, where it's going to be picked up. If it's outside, then take your reading outside near that fresh air intake. That's what's getting to the evaporator. In terms of the fresh automatic controls, your testing procedure generally is going to bypass that and you're going to set it to max cool. You're going to turn it down to where it says low. Now, if you have a problem with cooling while it's in automatic, well, we're going to get to that in a little bit to show you some tips on that as well. So great question. Thank you so much. Very good. All right. So that was okay for testing, but is there some way that we can do it better? Well, let's take a look at this. Let's add component temperatures to the data. What do I mean by that? What's the temperature of the refrigerant going in the evaporator? And what's the temperature coming out? What's the temperature going in the condenser? And what's the temperature coming out? So little thermocouplers or measuring with some sort of temperature device. Yeah, and that's a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. And we're going to uh, tap it again, but I'm going I'm to throw that in right now. Here's the, one of the cons to this method. You can't access the EVAP inlet and outlet anymore on these expansion valve systems unless you take the case out. We're not doing that. Very and you got to use a contact thermometer of some type. You cannot use your IR gun or your thermal imager for this. So I'm going to go, Pete, why is that? Why can't I put my little laser gun against that shiny tube? That's a great question, G. Uh, we've both done a lot of stuff related to thermal imaging, and if you've seen any of those, it all has to do with something called thermal emissivity. And what that means is the ability of an object to give off its energy. And it varies 
based on the type of object. And here's something I learned not too recently. If you're thinking about what the emissivity of an object might be, think of it in terms of its electrical conductance. If it's going to conduct electricity real well, it's going to have high thermal emissivity. It's going to be really good at doing that. Okay. But then you also have some other factors that come into play. And here's why you can't use it for this. It's called thermal reflectivity. Ah. Those shiny lines are, are like, just like little mirrors. They're reflecting off the energy of everything around it. And that's going to mask the energy it's actually sending out. So you're not going to get an accurate measurement. So a little tidbit that you can do is if you take some black, not shiny tape, Mm -hmm. and put it around, that would give you a good reading. Or you can spray it with some flat black, black paint, paint if you want to do that. To keep around. The only thing is, don't get it on a dude's car. Right. Because if it's on my right. car, I'm going to be bent. Right, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but it can help us determine how well the heat load is being accepted and dispersed through the system. Again, as G said right at the very beginning, it's a matter of heat going to, or cold going to, heat going to uh, cold. cold. Thank right? You. Heat Hot going to cold. cold. Got to make sure I get that right. And we're going to go in a little bit more detail as we go along, but there's two kinds of heat loads that we're referring to. One is the actual temperature of whatever it is that we're looking at. The other is how much latent heat that element can hold inside. And that's what we want the refrigerator to do. We want it to pull as much heat out and hold on to it as it possibly can. We want to saturate that refrigerator and, you know, with Speaking load. of latent heat, we should we should kind of explain that we're looking at a liquid and a vapor. And that's why mm -hmm. air conditioned systems work so well. We're not looking, like say, at a engine cooling system. The engine cooling system stays a liquid or you got a big problem, right? <laughs> and you got so, a big bug. Right there. <laughs> Dead bug. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I was waiting for somebody to tap that into the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> Would they just pop on me? Or you you just pop on you know, either. All right. <laughs> Flying around. Dead guy now. Anyway, um, when you have a change of state, that's how we remove heat. So to hot to cold inside a car, we're boiling the low-pressure liquid refrigerant, and then we're sucking it, the suction side of the compressor, and we're squeezing it, discharging it, the high side, bringing it out to the condenser where the high pressure vapor goes into a high pressure liquid. And of course, let's say you're 300 and something pounds of pressure you have there. Let's take the 300. It's not 300 degrees outside. Well, close where he lives, but it's a whole other <laughs> ball game. Okay. But outside is cooler is where we release the heat energy to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's when we change state from the high pressure gas to the high pressure liquid goes back through the system. And that's why, you know, when you brought that up, I'm like, a lot of people don't understand the principles of electricity. Yeah, kind of reminds me of something we've also harped on quite a bit, is the old voltage drop testing techniques. Again, it's a matter of how the electrical, need. just basic electrical fundamentals, and he's absolutely right, to help your AC diagnostics, you want to make sure that you understand what's supposed to be happening and where in that refrigerant circuit. No doubt. So in a properly functioning AC system, when we're doing that component check, we should see less than or equal to a 20 degree difference between ambient and center duct. And that's what we talked about earlier. So we want to see 20 degrees or more. Older vehicles, 30 degrees, 40 degrees is a good number to use. Uh, best to compare, again, with the air that's actually being fed to the evaporator. Now on the condenser side, 20 degrees to 50 degrees drop between the condenser inlet and the outlet. And as G mentioned, the inlet is where that compressed vapor is getting pushed into, high pressure vapor is getting pushed into. And when we go from low to high pressure, what happens to the gas? Temperature goes up, right? Exactly. So we expect it to be hot going in. But now as it passes through the condenser, it should get rid of that, not only the heat load, the element that gaseous element is carrying, but once that's gone, it should actually drop a few more degrees in temperature so that we can be assured that everything that leaves that condenser is liquid. No we gas, no bubbles. No, gas. no okay? bubbles. So that's the way to do it. If it's less than 20 degree difference, can indicate a problem with airflow across the condenser or an overcharged system. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If there's too much or the flow is not correct over the condenser, 
it's not going to get a chance to get rid of that heat load. If it's greater than 50 degrees, it could be a fact of a low charge, air in the system, or even a restriction inside the condenser itself. Let it's, me stop you with that air in the system, Pete. This is another important thing. Now, on 1234YF, we have to identify the refrigerant. Mm -hmm. But if you're working on 134A and you're not identifying it, air is a bad thing. It, that means you're low on a charge. And air and 134A and 1234F, uh, 1234YF, excuse me, causes hydrofluoric acid. And it starts eating away from the inside out. So if you had an itsy bitsy leak, oh, it's going to turn into a big leak. Yeah. Well, what do you think caused that leak in the first place? And then, <laughs> then we have problems with that little valve called the expansion block or valve that is not going to move so much. That rod is going to be seized up. Yeah. And we're not going to be able to take liquid refrigerant from the high pressure side, get it down to that low pressure side, right. and get it in there. Right. So air is a big problem. Yeah. We look at air all year long just by hooking our identifier. Yeah, and, and to further G's point, I have seen way too many guys who are on flat rates. They're trying to get that job done. The AC system is open while they're waiting for huh. the part. And then they get the part on there, and rather than take that 30 minutes or so to vacuum the system down prior to recharge, they just fill it up. So what's in the system, when they threw the new part on and sealed it back up, it's full of air right from the get-go. And that So brings it's us, a lot more common yeah, than you might think. Another thing. Anytime you get anything that is an air-conditioned part, should have caps on it, should be in a vacuum, you should remove, not the caps from that, leave it. Go take the component off, whether whatever it'll be, take it off, duct tape. We use Gorilla duct tape, and we have many a caps, but sometimes the caps don't fit too right. good. So we duct tape it, and then when we're ready to put this new component in, don't forget to add oil. That's another problem. People think they can just add oil to it. Put in the proper amount by looking in your information system. Is it two ounces, one ounce, three ounce, whatever? Put it in then get this thing evacuated down. Mm -hmm. And of course, anytime we replace a major component, we should always change, and most of the new condensers automatically have a receiver dryer in them, okay? But if not, like the one I have right over there, you could unscrew it and put a new desiccant in there, yeah. the drying yeah. agent. Or put an accumulator in if it's an accumulator system. Absolutely. Well, and, and of course... Anytime you have the system open for any, any reason, you should be replacing those two components because there's moisture in there and you've got to get it all out. And, and besides, this can has a lifespan and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So that's a good reason to always make sure that you do have to open up the system, place the receiver dryer, replace the accumulator, whichever one it is, so that you can get whatever the last little bit of moisture might be in there out and, and, and contained. Another point I want to make to, to uh, what G said, I have some great photographs of R134A multi-flow condensers and just how small those passages are. I mean, you're looking about this, the head of, the, of a ballpoint pen is about the size of those passages. If you think that's small, go look at a cutaway for one of these 1234YF systems. It's like half that, if that much. So what I'm getting at here is if you've got a compressor that grenaded, don't waste your time. You're not flushing any of those heat exchangers out. And, and they say now, you can't. The OEs don't want you to flush them. No. And Pete's right. When you look at how small these orifices are, forget it. You need to change it. You need to put filters in. You know, AirSet makes these great little screens that if you put them in, you're going to catch a lot. You're going to have to warn the customer, mm -hmm. hey, you may need to come back because it's going to pick residual stuff up. Okay. And if it has a, rather than an expansion valve, that should be replaced. But if it has an orifice tube, definitely replace it. And the only ones we put in here are now what the OEs are using as well. I've been using them for years, is the adjusting um, orifice tubes. Mm. Those are really good. They have a thermal bulb in the end of it. So rather than a fixed orifice that may be a hole that big, it goes, and it makes it cooler. Wow. So that's Did really that. has helped us. Yeah. Did not that's, know that. Yeah. Now we talked about the condenser. Let's take a look at the invet evap. Now, what would you think on the evap? Big pressure temperature difference? Not really. We want it less than five degrees between the inlet and the outlet. Okay. If it's too much, 
of a difference between what went in and what went out. Well, if the outlet is colder than the inlet, could be a, a sign of an overcharge or a metering problem, as you pointed out. Maybe that, that expansion valve is corroded, stuck, the fixed orifice tube has got debris in it, anything like that. If the inlet is colder than the outlet, then that can be a result of undercharge. Maybe there's too much oil in it. Do you think that's a problem today? Oh, yeah, because the oil chargers are so small on these cars, sometimes less than two ounces. Right. And that brings up a couple of things. One, never just add a lot of oil. Thank God in 1234YF, there's no oil is on the machines. Okay. But if you use the squeeze type that goes into mm -hmm. the, the, the low side, don't overdo it. One to two ounce max. And by the way, if you think, I didn't put it in the condenser. Oh, I found out it needed three ounces. Those three ounces are not going to go when you're squeezing in. They're not going to find their way there. It's three ounces to go in there. No, never forget that the oil, what does it do? Trap some refrigerant in that area. And that's why they're doing it. And when we look at expansion valves, see, I keep this around, Pete? <laughs> Here's my expansion valve. This is a hose, and I'm not going to hit you with water, okay? But I do want to bring a point up with this. An expansion valve or block is basically like this. If I am cold inside, well, then it's only going to spray a small amount in of high pressure to low pressure liquid. If it's warm, it's full blast, full stream, full stream. So that makes the difference of an expansion valve or block. If I'm warm, that thermal bulb that sits up top is going to go, hey, I'm going to open you all the way up, but I can't open you all the way up if I have a problem in there. I didn't have enough refrigerant in there, and we said it makes hydrofluoric acid because of the air, or I have just some mechanical problem. And it's right. the same thing true with a clogged screen on an orifice. Looks similar. Right. To Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Question. On the screen, all right, uh, Ezra says, with an imploded compressor leading to the replacement of the condenser, is it still not advisable to flush the lines? Great question, Ezra. The only line you can flush is one that doesn't have anything in it. What I mean by that is there's a muffler incorporated in the line. Done. You can't flush it. I would strongly say if it's an IH, IHX or one that has an internal heat exchanger, as this Camaro does, you can't flush that. Uh, condensers, you can't flush those. Or the evaporator system too. The right. injector system for start stop, you can't flush that. Yeah, the evaporator, you can't flush that. You may think you can, but according to the manufacturers, if you look up all the data, they want you to take the evaporator out of the vehicle so that you can turn it, tough it, shake it, get it in every which direction. It. And if you're going to do all that, you put a new one in. Now, I know I've I heard a lot of guys tell me this. Well, my customer's not going to buy that. You know, you tell me the, the compressor grenaded. And now I got to have the compressor. I got to have the, the condenser. I've got to have the evaporator. I've got to have the receiver dryer. I've got to have the expansion valve. I've got to have the lines that have mufflers in them. If they're not a straight line. And the, and the customer is going to look at you like you're out of your mind. Well, let me ask you, Mr. Customer, do you want to pay me once or do you want to pay me twice? Because if I just put the new compressor on there and we don't do anything about the debris that's in the system, you'll be back. And it's Again, not going to be on us. That's why we put the screens up. And you can get them from Napa, CarQuest, O'Reilly's. They all have those screens sold to them by um, uh, Airset. So they package them. They're good. But they are going to come back, Pete, because like you said, you can't get it out. And no. forget about blowing air through the line. You may have to replace lines. Yeah. If the compressor is not, it's just, the system is just not going to function the way it's supposed to. Unless it's 100%. Clean. And lucky, a lot of the new ones, the new compressors, variable compressors, don't seem to grenade like the older piston uh, compressors. Yeah. Those seem to have a problem when metal came out, ripped the hose up. We used to call it black death on all the fluids. They don't seem to be as prevalent now as before. Compressor yeah. goes, you're going to get some debris. Again, those little screens really help. And, and right at the very end, we have some food for thought for you. about. And here's a good, you know, good part of that is why... Why wouldn't the compressor last? Where did that come from? That stuff came from somewhere, right? If there was moisture in the system or, there, or, or there's air in the system to lead to that, that contamination, and that's what causes the problem. Sure. You know, it's not the oil in the refrigerant. It's not, that's not going to cause the problem. Anyway, next question. Marty asks, is there a different flush used in 1234YF? 
I don't think there's a difference, but I will tell you, I don't know of any manufacturers that want you to flush the systems, period. I have not read that. Okay. And, you know, there are a couple of companies uh, that sell flush machines. Yes. Um, but I don't know anyone. You know, here in New York State, they would call that a non-quality repair. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone brought it in and you as the shop owner recommend or the tech, you recommend this flush with this machine. It don't work. Well, that person goes to DMV here in New York State. That's a non-quality repair. You'd have to give them the money back. Why? Because he always says don't flush it. Right. And right. people are going to get mad. You know, if if you do an air conditioning job on a customer's car and it gets warm out, they're going to be coming back screaming at you. Because they could feel that right away. It's not like, oh, right. my car is a little hesitant. Right. It's bumping a little bit. The AC, it's like turning their radio off. You do that, they're going to be complaining instantly. I've seen customers that will spend $1,000 fixing their AC system and not change oh, their brake pads. You bet. <laughs> they want to they be gotta have that. They got to be comfortable. But still, one more point on the flushing, uh, guys and gals. You don't know if you got all the flushing solvent out. That's if you want to make sure, then you have to blow it out, uh, and you can't use compressed air because that's got moisture in it. Ah, so you're going to have to have some inert gas. And then, even then, you have to let it sit and dry. That's to waste, way too much wasted time. And then it could be dangerous, too. 134A yeah. and compressed air, about six pounds, yeah. could cause a baboon. Yeah. So we don't want that. Yeah. Safety. Absolutely. So back to the F-350. Here are the measurements that I got off of it. Condenser inlet, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. The condenser outlet, 124, showing a 46 degree difference in temperature. EVAP inlet going in, 54 and a half. Coming out, 60.8. That's a 6.3 degree difference. Now, they're both kind of a little bit on the high side. That's a little bit different than what we saw earlier. Definitely. And let's just kind of talk about that for a minute. Let's look at the condenser, for example. Remember we talked about why it would be on the higher side? If there's not enough refrigerant in the system, we're going to get rid of all the heat really quick. And then we got this nice unladen gas that's converting to a liquid. And by the time it gets to the bottom of the condenser in that liquid form, well, now we're just physically bringing the temperature down further. And that's what we've got here. Okay. So maybe I don't have enough in here. Well, earlier we were talking about maybe I have too much. Same thing here. If it's cold going in and it's warming up a little too much coming out, well, that means that everything I sent into it took in the heat load, but it couldn't take no more. And now it's physically warming up. There's a difference. There's a difference. Remember we talked before. There's the physical temperature of that liquid and gas or gas. And then there's how much heat load is being held in by that liquid or gas. And that brings us to these uh, two terms. And I'm going to tell you what. I have never, I never heard of these terms until I got more involved with Max, that's now called the Mobile Air Climate System. They changed the name. Yeah, the name has changed. New logo, new that's everything. Right, that's right. A new logo. Yeah, and they and that and here's a little plug for them. They do have their event coming up in Orlando this fall. We'll both be there. Both be there. So if you can make it, we'd love to see you. But that's where I started hearing some of these terminologies. And as I dug into it, I found out this this has been used by commercial refrigerant uh, techs for years. Correct. So let's take a look at the, what they two mean. Subcooling is the difference between the boiling point temperature of the refrigerant in the condenser, because that's what's happening there, right? The boiling point of the temperature of the condenser and the actual temperature of the refrigerant as it leaves the condenser. That's not the 46 degree difference I just showed you. This is the temperature, the boiling point. Well, that's where G said earlier. This is when that change of state occurs whether it's going from a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid, when it begins to go into that change of state, that's when it's most able to either take on or get rid of the heat that it's carrying. And as we'll show you in a moment, that temperature can remain perfectly constant, right. even though the pressure might change. Superheating, on the other hand, is the difference between the boiling point of the refrigerant in the evaporator and the actual temperature as it leaves the evaporator. Now, again, this is not the 6.3 degree difference that I just showed you based simply on the inlet and outlet temperatures. This is a comparison between the outlet temperature and the temperature of the refrigerant while it's in that state of change. 
And we'll show you a little bit more as we go. So to clarify, so you can understand, condensation is when a vapor loses heat, loses that latent heat, and turns into a liquid. But subcooling is when that liquid is further cooled below that temperature. Okay, that's when the physical temperature begins to drop below what it took to change the state. And that's why you got coming up some new stuff they need to know about that's on these vehicles. Absolutely. Boiling is when a liquid gains heat and transforms into a vapor. Y'all see that? Set the kettle on the stove, turn the heat up, and you can see it start to steam. And when that water makes that conversion to steam, that's when it's able to take in the majority of its heat load. That's when it takes in all of its latent heat. But if we keep it going, then it'll become what's called superheated, and the vapor is heated be beyond that boiling, boiling point. point. Instead of like water, instead of 212, that vapor gets to be 220, 230, whatever the case might be. That's called superheat. Very. Now, I want to go back, because G mentioned this earlier, but like we said in the beginning, this is really critical that you understand what's going on when and where in that circuit. So let's start at the heart. The compressor is taking that low pressure vapor and compressing it, just like the engine's compressing the air charge in the engine. Or squeezing your hands, you create more heat. And Absolutely. So, and when we compress that gas, we're not changing its state. So the heat load that it's holding, that it took from the evaporator is still there, but we've raised the temperature, the physical temperature of the gas. And why are we doing that? So we can remove that heat. Sure, it's not going to do me any good to send a 40 degree temperature gas into my condenser when it's 110 degrees outside the condenser. I've got to get that temperature above what the ambient temperature outside is so that heat will go to the, the cold. cold. Right, hot goes to cold. And if we didn't press that, compress it and raise it, that would never happen. So that's important. We have a, a low pressure vapor coming in, making a high pressure vapor here comes down, turns into a high pressure liquid, then goes through an IHX, an expansion valve, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We have a low pressure liquid that goes in, turns into a low pressure vapor as it leaves, because the heat in the car is coming into this, like a big magnet. That's how mm -hmm. you gotta think of it. The hot in the car is gonna boil the liquid refrigerant in there, and then we push it out and the whole thing starts all yep. over again. Now, what do we not want going into the compressor, Jay? Oh, we don't want liquid. We don't, we don't want, want no any liquid, liquid in there, do we? Because that, that's the bad thing. Uh, that's when you slow. That's the when you grenade the compressor. And by the way, you know, a lot of the new air conditioning equipment now, really, as the snap-on machine will be on, really gives you step-by-step -step so you don't slug the compressor. You bend yeah. those reed valves or you bend, break a plate or whatever in there, you're done. Right. You're done. The compressor right. is out to lunch. So we're sending nothing but a gas into the condenser. As it passes through, it's going to lose that latent heat to the outside air, and it's going to change state. By the time it gets to the bottom, we don't want any gas left. We want right. it to become all liquid. liquid. So we're going to take it to that point and a little bit beyond. Remember what we called that? Subcooling. You take it a little bit lower by the time it gets out. And we so, should talk about the fan. Now, many vehicles, unlike yours, have electric fans. Absolutely. An electric fan, is it sucking or blowing? It's a very important thing. We have pusher fans. A lot of Mercedes are up front, and they're pushing the air through. If we have air on the other side, it better be pulling, pulling it air through, through. Yep. not pushing. Now, the reason why I say that, I've seen some cheap parts we won't say where they're from okay actually wired wrong and i've seen people wire stuff wrong so you have to make sure and if we have a clutch fan a thermal fan if we have fan shrouded missing this all is going to change and you're going to lose yep. your cool okay you will right. not be cool right absolutely so we're still taking that now high pressure liquid ihx Oh. IHX, what is that? That is called an internal heat exchanger, and it's very common on a lot of the late model vehicles. I'm going to show you an image of that for a little bit later, and we'll talk a little bit more about what it does. Right. Maybe but, they don't even notice it. 
Yeah, you don't even if you look real closely and you see that you've got two lines merging into one and then splitting again, it's That's an IHX. The baby. So now we're taking the high pressure liquid into the expansion valve where it's metered out kind of like the spray in an old carburetor jet, right? Just like comes out of the guard nose. And these little tiny liquid droplets are now entering into the evaporator where now the blower motor is passing that hot air across this now cooled down liquid because of the drop in temperature. It's going to start taking that heat load from that hot air. It's going to get to the point where it can't hold any more. And it's going to change state right during that process and become that gas that exits and goes back to the compressor. So we have to make sure that when it leaves, it's all gas. Now, no liquid do you left have over. an accumulator system that they're going to look at, a flooded system, or we should talk about it? Okay. Nah. So if we don't have a receiver dryer, what we have is a accumulator. And by the way, two things with an accumulator system. Number one, not all of the liquid goes into a gas right here in the evaporator on those because they, sure. they're a little bit different of a setup. What happens is it captures refrigerant on the bottom of an accumulator. And you got to remember, even when you recover the refrigerant on these, a lot of them will freeze up. And that's where you need a game plan for, hey, how am I going to get that out? You can use a heat gun. You can do the open hood, run some, run the vehicle for a certain amount of time. You have to remove that refrigerant. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's a different type of system that would not have an expansion block. Yeah. Now, they seem to be doing away with those. You don't see Pretty much. Stuff. And, you know, be, and I'll tell you why. Because the systems today are so much more efficient. Everything on the vehicle is high tech, low tolerance, a lot less room for error when it comes to working on them. They're actually they're building high performance cars right fresh off the assembly line. The clearances that are there, the amount of refrigerant Those. being used is smaller than ever and still doing the job of getting rid of the heat. Oh, so, so Pete, we can't go to the pot store and just get one of those cans that says you'll, you know, you can fix everything. And I just shake it. And I think I put it in the low side. So I don't yeah. blow myself up. I tried the high side, but oh, my. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. guys be careful out there because people are buying it. I'm, we're joking around here, but they're buying it. We come up with a lot of sealant, tons of sealant, you know, and if that sealant gets into your machine, Guy that used to rent uh, the shop off me years back. In fact, my snap-on machines, he ruined. Lucky at the time I was teaching for snap-on. They helped me out. He, we had the tool. It had just come out, but he never identified sealant in there. He went in and locked the valves up. It's an epoxy. Yeah. And it's not going to really work in your car when people think that. So you need to test. You need to test that, and you need to test for the refrigerant that's in there. Absolutely. You know, with these third world countries unloading R12, R13, R22, they're mixing it. And you know, at max, a 30-pound container, of even 134A, had water in the bottom, sand in the bottom, dirt in the bottom, and mixtures of all different gases. Yep. But the bottle looked like it was a name brand. Yes, sir. It perfect was counterfeit. Perfect counterfeit. I mean, they do the stuff so good. Yep. Yeah, well, this was an international be, brand parts house. You know, it was like it was like your son buying that watch down in Chinatown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. It looked like a real inside Rolex, story, but it wasn't inside story. <laughs> yeah, to continue, like said, like G pointed out. I, I mean, if you go to your local parts house, no matter who they are, and you walk into the, I mean, it's right there in the front row, right behind the cash registers, and and it's right at eye level. And every single little do it yourself or home yeah, chart can it. that I've seen has got sealing in it. If you really just want a can of version refrigerant, even the little cans, you got to go poke around the bottom shelf to see if you can find it. Yeah, so you make sure that you do that. And when we go the, on the car, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I do want to point out too, let's talk about the heat, internal heat exchanger there for a moment. And we'll have a picture of it in a bit. But a lot of people wonder why are we running the high pressure and low pressure lines together here? What's going on here? Are we trying to, to warm up the low side a little more? No, actually, what we're trying to do is we're trying to cool down the, the high pressure side. side a little bit. We're trying okay. to get a jump start on it. Yes, sir. That's what it's for. You know, it was like Jerry when he was running that race. He kind of cheated. You ever see that on Seinfeld? 
kind of jumped off the line. That's what's going on there. They're <laughs> yeah. jumping off the Give line. Give a little jump. All right, so why are superheat and subcool important for you guys to know nowadays? Here's why I think. Superheat tells you that all the possible heat transfer has occurred, and there's only gas your refrigerant that's being fed to the compressor. So it helps us know that we've got just the right amount of refrigerant in the system. Same on the subcool side. It ensures that all the heat load has been removed and only liquid refrigerant is reaching the metering device. We can't meter vapor real well. No. So we don't want bubbles going way. through the system. All right. So that's why these are important to know. Now here, like I said, here's the internal heat exchanger. You can see a really good picture here, low side, high side, and they're all incorporated into one tube here. Is used to transfer heat between the low pressure and the high side pressure flow circuits. Its function is to improve system performance by further subcooling the refrigerant being supplied to the evaporator, although the refrigerant control device. Okay. Now, what was subcooling? It, it, it wasn't making it cooler, it was making the physical temperature hotter. Oh, excuse me, I'm back. My bag right. subcooling. Yeah. Dropping. But it's making it more efficient when it gets to the it's, evaporator. It's more efficient. That's the name <laughs> of the game. If you could cool it before it's going in, if you can get that that jump on it, it's going to yeah. make a big difference. Yep, absolutely. Oh, these are great. And that, these now, are great gauges. Here's what I want to take you look. These are a set of snap-on gauges for a 1234YF system. And I know we've all had our manifold gauges hanging probably in the side of our toolbox. And then we hook them up to the car to check the pressures. Or... We just get lazy. We use the machine gauges, you know, on our recovery equipment to check the pressures. But I want you to take a look at something that you may or may not have ever noticed. Did you ever see the inside scales on these gauges? And take a look at those. Both of them have them. What are those? And, you know, Pete, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I had never seen this before. I always say one Fahrenheit and one PSI are roughly about the same, you know, depending on the temperature. The one, but yeah, it's 134. Good, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good kind of way Pull to think up. of it. But look at this, guys. This is accurate, super accurate. Yeah. It's right on the gauge. And here's the difference, my friend. When, and, and when we use that rule of thumb, that was if we wanted to know what, uh, how much uh, we had in our tank, tank, whether it had any air in it or not. So that's or if the, the vehicle was off and we were at a steady state on both sides, yeah. that would roughly give it to you on a cool vehicle. Yeah. So that was like a physical temperature measurement. This is telling you what the saturated temperature is. In other words, that's the state of change temperature. That's a constant temperature, as you'll see in a moment. When that refrigerant is going through that change of state, its temperature remains constant. Yeah. Even though the pressure might change. And look, you, when you're there at 30 and 30, Pretty much okay. the same there. Then it starts changing as pressure goes up, but it's pretty close. Pretty close. Pretty damn close. That's that's a nice setup. So again, it's the temperature saturation of the refrigerant. In this case, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 43 degrees Fahrenheit is what 44 psi uh, pressure means. It's a 43 degrees saturation temperature. And in this case, at 167, it's 330. Uh, well, I have it backwards here, don't I? Yeah. I do. My bad. 330 psi was, right. if it was equals 167 degrees. My bad. See, as much as I try to make sure everything's right, we're going to make a mistake. Lucky while. he did that, not yeah, me. He did. I, I did it. My fault. <laughs> oh, so that's a that's a better way of doing it. Looking at these different numbers and comparing going in, going out, if you can, so you get a feel for how well that heat load is being taken in and dispersed, and how if it's gotten enough to do its job here's something even better maybe and i'm saying maybe we've got the question mark because we're going to experiment with this this is what i said earlier this is an enthalpy chart enthalpy 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 not empathy enthalpy well what the heck is that enthalpy is a thermal dynamic quantity that's equivalent to the total heat content of a system it's equal to the internal energy of the system. In other words, the latent heat energy in the refrigerant plus the product of its pressure and volume. It's a measure of how much heat a gas or liquid can hold and how much heat is needed to change the physical temperature. In symbols, enthalpy represents its H and equals the sum of the internal energy E and the product of the pressure P and volume V of the system, or H equals E plus P 
times B. But now, do I care if you know that part? No, I really don't. But but Pete, you know what this really means? In English, this is a great way to do a refrigerant diagnosis on a vehicle. Absolutely. That's the key here. So maybe you never heard of it or they never seen it. Yeah. But you're going to want to get this. You know, this reminds me of something I worked on many years ago with Neutronics looking at this, looking at different pressures and thermal couplers. This right here can tell you if your system is efficient or not. And it can really save you a lot of time. Right. And I don't, I want to tell right now, again, big shout out to Jim Kakonis for bringing it to my attention. And again, check out his article in the June issue where he talks all about this particular uh, procedure. And I do want to stress, this is not in and of itself the only way to diagnose this. Correct. It's another tool. It's helpful. To help you with your diagnostics. It's like whether you're going to pull out your test light, your meter, or your scope. To check out a system, whether you're using your scan tool and your scope, it's how you use your tools to get to the final solution. You pull out what you need to solve the problem. Now, now this may be the backhoe rather than the shovel, but many times you need the backhoe. Yep. Okay. And this may be a case. It's like, and what I mean by that, in case you didn't get it, sometimes you need a scope, but sometimes you don't need a scope. Right. So you don't have to always pull something out if you don't need it. But on many vehicles, you don't want to be second guessing yourself when yeah. we're looking at maybe a little over a pound that some of these vehicles take with 1234 YF. I think all the help you can get, the better off you'll be in getting that vehicle cool the way it should operate. Absolutely. So really, what does this mean for us in the real world? That the use of this enthalpy chart is going to allow you to view the heat transfers in action. And as G pointed out, can help you determine if the system is working efficiently with the charge it has in it. So let's take a look first at the chart elements. This is a very simplified version. If you go up on a Google and start uh, Googling enthalpy charts, you're going to see they're a lot more complex than this for those thermodynamic engineers. There's a lot of stuff they use this chart to take a look at. Don't care about any of those. I'm looking to fix my car or my customer's automotive system. So the very first part is we kind of call the shark fin. Kind of looks like a shark fin, doesn't it? Yeah. So a lot of people refer to that as the shark fin. What I want to point out in here is that anything we have charted in here is in the process of changing state. It's either going from a liquid to a vapor or a vapor to a liquid. And notice how the temperature lines on there are horizontal. Because during that change of state, the temperature doesn't change. The physical temperature doesn't change. Now, once we get out over to the left, well, that's a subcooled liquid. Everything on that side of the graph is a subcooled liquid. You remember that where that's coming from? That's where it's passing through the condenser. So that's going to give us a little bit of information on how well it's going through the condenser. And notice here that the temperatures go vertical. That's because once that change of state has taken place, Heat load's gone. We can raise the physical temperature and we get into that subcool range that we talked about earlier. Remember what that meant? The difference in temperature between this and the outlet of the uh, condenser. The other thing on the right side of the shark fin is superheated gas. That's the evaporator. Okay, that's where we're going to look at the evaporator. Now, here's what you need to gather in order to complete this chart. It's not difficult. First, we need the absolute high side pressure. That means the pressure reading on your gauge corrected for atmospheric wherever you might be, be living. Now, in my case, if I was another two feet or three feet lower, I would be below sea level. Thank God I just live on this sandbar that sticks out from the end of the southern part of the country. But I'm right at sea level. So for me, that's going to be my gauge reading plus 14.7 PSI to give me absolute pressure. You can correct that for wherever you are based on your altitude. I also want to know what the absolute low side pressure is. Again, pressure reading plus the atmospheric correction. And now we want to know the actual temperature reading of the refrigerant just before the metering device. Okay, that's going to mean I'm going to have up in the low side right up near that block, right near the expansion valve. And also want to check the temperature reading in the refrigerant at the compressor inlet. All right, that's where it's come out of the compressor and now it's entering the condenser. So, oh, excuse me, my bad, no. compressor inlet. Mm -hmm. So where it's coming 
out of the evaporator, evaporator and going the into the S, compressor. The S side, the suction side. Yeah. Here's a reading for the Ford. 214 PSI absolute, 41 PSI on the low side absolute, 122 degrees at 78 degrees. So now I've got my numbers and I just have to plot them on the graph. All right. Once we have that completed, I've got my two dot points here. Now I need to draw the lines. The top left point, you want to go vertical and horizontal. And on your um, lowest most point, you want to go horizontal till the two points meet. Do you follow me on that? To where these two points meet. On the right side, though, of the lower point, you want to follow what you look in the bottom, you'll see what the enthalpy line, they actually kind of go on a slight angle if you look very closely at your diagram. We want to kind of follow that, again, to intersect the upper line. And now we have our enthalpy chart. Everybody with me so far? Lucky the thing does it automatically. Yes, and we'll show you that too in a moment. Now, here's what we can see right now. The temperature of the refrigerant in the evaporator is under freezing. It's about 28 degrees Fahrenheit. See how it charts on the graph? Remember what that figure is? That's the temperature of the refrigerant as it's undergoing the change of state. The temperature of refrigerant in the condenser is about 131 degrees. Again, constant change of state. Where else do you think I could get those numbers? Remember the gauge I showed you and the and the temperature reading co uh, that coordinates with the pressure? Well, that, that should equate pretty close to what we have here on the chart. Now, the upper left corner is how much superheat we have in the system. And our bottom right, excuse me, upper left is subcool and the bottom right is superheat. I know I put them in blue and red for a reason, trying to keep myself straight. <laughs> Notice how much we have quite a bit here. Keep that in mind. It's kind of way out there to the right. The superheat, remember we said that was, equals the temperature of the refrigerant as it enters the compressor inlet and the temperature of the refrigerator or refrigerant in the evap during the change of state. Again, right there, we're about 49 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. The subcool number here is the difference in temperature between the refrigerant and the condenser and the refrigerant leaving the condenser. That's only about six degrees. So my superheat down here, I know it's blue and red. I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but superheat is 49 and a half degrees here in the bottom. Subcool is only about six degrees up at the top, All right? If the superheat level is less than we expect, it means that there's liquid refrigerant still leaving the evaporator. It hasn't gotten rid of all its latent heat yet, so we can't heat it up physically until we do. That could be the overcharge, poor airflow over the evaporator. Oh, what could cause that? Gee, well, you mentioned that earlier, especially with vehicles who don't have cabin air filters. All the debris and leaves and garbage that finds its way in there and blocks the fins. If you don't see anything dripping out of the tube, as soon as you clear the tube, you might want to take your borescope open and check those fins. So that's another thing can affect airflow over the evaporator. The metering device, that expansion valve, could be leaking or the incorrect application. If it's stuck and it's letting it pass through when it shouldn't, it's adding too much refrigerant to the system. You know, just a quick thing here, the one we just did, you know, where the drip tube was not draining down at all. And you got to be careful. Don't put anything sharp up there. And if you're going to put your, your camera up there, well, we kind of got up and seen there was a lot of debris in the box. Mm -hmm. We use very, very low pressure water. I'm talking like very little. Went up. It was like an enema. <laughs> All the junk came out, went back up. Go oh, wow. out. Went out and worked perfect. Wow. Now, don't be ridiculous and put... You know, high pressure water up there. You know, you don't want to use that Gates flushing tool because if it wasn't broken, it will be broken. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, something like that works real good. And we, we just did that about a week ago. Now, if the superheat level is more higher than expected, it could mean that the quantity in the refrigerant in the system is not enough. 
Okay. In other words, we pass that gaseous or that, that liquid droplets into the evaporator. They all change state and they're only a third of the way through. So they got nothing left to do, but get physically hotter and they're not helping cool the car. Yeah, exactly. So that could be an undercharge condition, undercharge condition, or maybe the metering device is restricted. Problem with the orifice tube or the expansion valve. Right. Now you can use, well, let's go back to that chart for a minute and take a look here. Okay, this was the Ford. The six degree subcool is pretty good. Generally, you'll see about, I think the five to 15 is, is for us a good number to look at. I know that a lot of commercial guys look to get it right at 10 and they'll make slight adjustments to the charge of that commercial system to get it right at 10. And if you try this at home, it, only, it takes very little to make these changes. So don't add a bunch and then let it sit. Add a little and then let it stabilize and, and check the measurement. But the superheat is 49 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Way, way too much. 20 to 30 maybe. So again, based on everything we looked at so far, is this a better indication of that undercharge condition that, that, that our second method kind of indicated? The first one led us to look at overcharge. The second one kind of hinted at the undercharge. Now we have charted proof that this is where we're probably looking. Now, here's some great uses for the chart. As G pointed out, it's gauging the effectiveness and efficiency of the refrigerant circuit. It can help pinpoint poor cooling due to factors other than a low refrigerant charge. If your efficiency chart looks good and it's not cooling enough, then maybe the problem's not in the refrigerant side. Now that goes back to what a lot of you were asking earlier regards the uh, automatic climate control systems, especially those with multi-zone climate control. Oh, so one of the doors are not working too good. Absolutely. Or maybe the mode door has not been homed or calibrated correctly. Absolutely. What Very about a research door that's broken? Oh yeah. Or, you know, someone did a heater core or a vap in there, you know, the little foam little stuff. Oh, we yep. don't need that. Right. And they throw it out or they didn't put the door in right. That's going to give you the problem. And a great part about that is let's say that you do have a customer that comes in. They have the code set related to that automatic system. And it is related to an actuator or a problem outside the casing. How do you know that that's going to be the only thing that affects the vehicle? How do you know that there's not any problems in the refrigerant circuit unless you can do this quick little chart and make sure that that indeed is okay? Maybe there's another problem that you're going to find out later. So, Pete, it's basically you're on this side of the firewall. Is it something in the doors or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or is it out here on this side of the firewall, meaning the engine, the condenser, all that stuff? Right. right it's kind of split in the system. Another thing I like about it is I'm a big proponent of doing these performance checks or, or routine checks when it's in for routine maintenance, right? When you bring it in for an oil change, we check the brake fluid, look at the tires, look at the brake pads, that kind of thing. What if it only took you a few minutes to complete one of these charts and you saw that there was a problem, especially when it's the summer months, right? And you go back to your customers and say, you know what? Yeah, it might be cooling okay, but you got a problem. And there are other factors that come into play when a system is over or undercharged, right? And that we're going to look at that definitely, too. Definitely true. All right. Here's another best question mark. Your scan tool. Oh, very important. Again, first, there are all kinds of PIDs in your scan tool that could allow you to perform these pressure gauge tests and temperature tests right from the comfort of the driver's seat. You don't even have to hook up don't anything. Hook your gauges. If you're dealing with an automatic climate control system that isn't functioning properly, of course, we want to know if there are any codes set, but if, barring that, we can look down the data PID list and see if there's anything that stands out. How about a temperature sensor? Let's say the EVAP temperature sensor's failed, and it goes to default. Now it's reading minus 40 degrees, or whatever the particular default for that manufacturer might be. Do you think this is going to allow the AC, AC system to work? Nope. We're going to no. shut it right off. I recently spoke to Steve Shaver, who's the director of training for Max, and he shared a story of a customer where the AC system will not cool in any position but full out cold. And it turned out to be just an interior temperature sensor that had gone out and it was providing misinformation. So the the that was bad. Now, 
This is a screen capture for, for an Audi test. There are a number of manufacturers now that allow you to perform a performance test on the vehicle's AC system through a guided function in the scan tool, as Audi does. So here's the beginning of that function. Following in the general descriptions, notes, and functions, what do we want to do? Vehicle not cooling. I'm going to use that one. And these are just a few of the screens to give you an idea. First, it's going to go ahead and give us a list of codes. Do we have any codes there? Well, I do have something for the recirculation flat motor. No signal. A B109231. I tell you guys, this is uh, not really going to get into the story on this one, but this is something I was doing for another project. Had this code, and I'm looking at the three wires going to the recirculation door motor. And I'm thinking, okay, power, ground, and then some type of signal back to the computer, maybe a potentiometer or something like that, so it knows what the position is. Doing a little more digging, guess what? That recirculation door motor was a recirculation door control module. It was its little own tiny computer. And the three wires were one for power, and the other two was going to a CAN network. To get signals from other components. And it was that signals from the CAN that had everything it needed internally to operate and monitor itself, and it sent those signals back out on the CAN network. Here's some of the PIDs you can look for. Review them. You see anything that stands out that shouldn't be right? The interior temperature. What's the outside air temperature? In the case of the Audi, it's got three separate climate control zones. Driver, passenger, and rear passenger. And every single one of them has their own temperature sensors and actuators associated with them to make all of this magic happen. So again, we go into the test, requires special tools and equipment. Again, here's the test requirements, just like we started off in the first few slides. Ambient temperature higher than 15 degrees Celsius. Checking the radiator condenser, make sure they're good. Making sure that the accessory drive and drive belt are good. I can't believe we just talked about this in a class the other day. I see some, you just Google it for yourself. Go on YouTube, how to check a serpentine belt. And the vast majority that show up are telling you to look for the cracks in the belts. And that hasn't been true for 15 years. If you see that, that belt was worn out long Whoa. ago. You need one of those special little plastic gauges. And Deco, Gates, and Conti, all the belt manufacturers will be glad to send you a box of them if you <laughs> want. And you need to physically use that to check the belt wear. If it's worn, it's going to slip. If it's going to slip, it's going to overheat, and it's going to transfer that heat to the bearings on every accessory drive component that it runs, including the compressor. So we want to make sure that that's working properly. Are all the air ducts, covers, and seals in place? Airflow through the dust and pollen filter is not blocked. When was the last time you checked the cabin air filter for your customer? It's not Very just for bad. HVAC importance. No. This is a health issue. You know that your interior of your cabin, especially with everybody keeping it all sealed up now, can be up to seven times more polluted Hold than the air in your home. Hold on. <laughs> We're going to put this on. That's what you get masked for. No, no, no. But you are, and, and they get dirty quick. They should be checked they at do. least once a year. I encourage you, every time your customer comes in, for a routine service, take a look at it. Some are not too easy to get to, but the majority take very little effort to take you know, a peek I like at. using that little anemometer to see if the airflow is good, because if that's clogged up, it's a quick way without diving under the dash or under the hood to pull these things out. Some of them are really brutal. Like some Hondas, you got to cut this little bar, and <laughs> yeah, then they yeah. do all that, and the customer goes, uh, you know, I'll do it next time. Makes it that much more difficult. So once we've finished and looked at all the test requirements, we can continue on with the test. And then it tells us how to set the controls. Pressure's on. Pre-select auto mode. Use the temperature controllers on the front air conditioning assembly and select it to cold, the LO symbol. Open all the dash panel vents and set the speed for all zones. And there's several more steps in it, but the bottom line is it's doing all the tests that we've been going over with our pressure gauges and our thermometers and our contact thermometers. 
and it's doing it for us. And then gives us a pass, no pass at the end. So what's the best way to perform an AC performance test? You're a professional technician. You use all the tools at your disposal and you select the one best suited for the need that you have at that moment. And I hope that of the ones that we shared so far, you'll find the one that helps you find the problem. So let's take a look at that Ford data one more time. Remember in the beginning, we did it the Ford way, little high, little low. Now we took a look at the pressure drop and we all learned that, okay, minus 21 is the same as it was when we compared the outside air with fresh air mode. So the efficiency of the refrigerant charge is the same, but it's not quite as cold as we would like it to be, or it should be. Condenser outlet and inlet kind of helped us verify that same issue because of the high difference in temperature. And then the enzyme chart, superheat is high, subcool is a little bit low. EVAT refrigerant temperature is below freezing. I'm looking at an undercharged condition, all right? So we're gonna do a little bit of charge. And what I did in this case was I just put a little bit of refrigerant at a time. I got that subcool number right around 10 degrees. And now look at the difference. Center duct temperature has now increased to a 48 degree difference, almost 10 degrees more than what I had earlier. And look at the position of the uh, superheat. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot lower, a lot more in range. Now, time to do it live. And we're going to do it on our guinea pig, this 2020 Camaro we've got sitting in the bay next door. All right. Whoop, we go back there. Right there. All right. So let's switch over to number camera two. So here we have our snap on uh, machine here. And remember, when working on refrigerant, always wear safety apparatus. So we're going to put our Safety goggles on. And if you want to pull up the pro demand, let's see yep. what we have to do to get this vehicle prepped. Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's connect our, our fancy pressure gauge or our snap on gauges. I, they're cool. We'll set these to the side for just a moment. All right, there's your pro demand. We're right on there. And while I'm three. pulling these and changing these ends here, I want to point out, guys and gals, you know those little silly little plastic caps that are on the lines, the test ports? They are a primary fitting, a primary seal. If they're missing, you need to replace them. That is very important. A lot of cars come in, Pete, without them, and, you know, makes it – that much more difficult. You're going to need the right tool to remove those ends to basically put new fittings on. All By right. the way, uh, that primary seal thing is also true of tire caps. Okay, we have our um, Pierre in the back here reminding us that the same applies. So those caps on the valve stems, primary seal. You need to make sure those are there. Keep that valve from getting open a little bit. I know that it's a bad thing when it's an RV trailer. I've had more than one blow out on me because of that. So let's take a look at what our requirements are. See if you could tell oh. me what the oh yeah. So the, actually, the, the Camaro, the Chevy gives us three different steps to take. The first one is to help us determine, according to Chevy, if we have enough refrigerant in the system to continue the test. Yep. So right? it has steps one, two, and three here. Park the vehicle inside or in the shade. Well, Check. we're in. We're in air condition here. Open the windows in order to ventilate the interior of the vehicle. Check. Three, a system, AC system was operating. Allow the AC system to equalize for two minutes. Turn ignition off. Install the air condition service, yada, yada. Yep. Uh, six, record ambient air temperature and humidity. Seven, record low and high side static pressure reading. Are right. both low and high side within specific range. So all right. So I don't know if you can zoom in on those gauges. And I'll see if I can read them with my safety glasses on. I'm looking at about let's see 74 psi on the low side, 
and right about the same on the high side. And the temperature in here is about 74 degrees. About 74 degrees. So, Mr. Trulia, if you'd be so kind, it says if we're over 74 degrees, that would be which one of those three? Probably right about the third one down where it says 70 PSI. I don't want to keep going back up to where you were. There you go. Oh, right. The um, left, uh, right hand, next column, yeah. 70 degrees PSI. And it says it should be. Where are we? Oh, right here. More than uh, 70 degrees PSI. Go to step two. Yeah. So it's say between 75 degrees or so, it should be about 70 PSI. That's what we got. So this is actually telling us so far, step one, we should have enough refrigerant in the system to continue our test. So we passed that. So number two, we're going to do like the performance test. What do we have to do there, Mr. It Julia? says close vehicle doors and windows. All right. Operate the driver window. Select the, uh, the HVAC settings. Set the AC on on. Coldest temperature setting. All right. The maximum blower speed. All right. Recirculation mode. The instrument panel IP outlet mode. All right. So that means panel mode. All IP outlets are open. All right. That's another important step right yeah. there. And what what I got giggled about was is what it says in there for the driver's side window. It doesn't say open it. It says open it five to six inches. Yep. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go ahead and set that up, and then we're going to run it, and we're going to get some measurements and see what we got from there. I'll put the exhaust fan on so we don't... Uh, have an issue? I don't want to choke you out or nothing. Well, new car, hard to do. <laughs> That's true. Oh. All Some right. A little noise. And, you know, one of the things we have done while that's going through its setup, take a look at using our thermal imager. I'm going to blow this up. This was the condenser. And right now that it's on, I'm going to show you a new picture that's going to be coming in. I just took the picture here. It should come in any second. Sure, it's going to make me a liar. So I just doing that, of course, you want to get time. There you go. Look at the difference oh, at between off and on. You can see heat transfer starting to happen. Go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. Oh, not at all. And I think that's a great way to visualize what we were talking about of what's going on inside the condenser. And not only is that the physical temperature, but that's heat-laden vapor heat. yep. that we have to get rid of. And you can actually you should be able to actually watch it as it goes down and get cooler near the bottom. But anytime you're doing one of these test course, you have to give it a few minutes in order to stabilize. Right now, I'm reading about 43 degrees at the duct. Wow. That's roughly a 31 degree difference. What we got and there in the pressure readings there? We're about 32 and... I guess about one, probably about 130 or so. All right. So we got 32, 130, and 43. Now we can go back to what Chevy says, see what we, what they tell us it should be. You could pull that back up on pro demand my friend you got it pro demand we go all right and we installed the thermometers at that in the left and right center panels apply the park and brake place in park neutral start the engine operate the ac system for five minutes inspect all the components any unusual noises Record the following information. Panel duct, airlet temperatures, low pressure, high pressure. There you go. Okay, very important. So now we have to go check the performance table. Yep. Compare the low and high side pressures 
and panel outlet temperatures to the AC performance table below. So here we go. If the pressures and temperatures recorded do not fall within the specific range, continue to operate the AC five additional minutes, record pressures and temperatures again, compare low and high side pressures and the panel outlet temperatures to the AC performance table below. Does all the temperature uh, recorded fall within this range? So now you can go yes or no, step four or step five. Right. You know the diagnostic chart that tells us what the pressure is supposed to be? There you go, a little more down. There you go, ambient temperature. We go right to wherever it's got the 74 degree range at. Right there. And then um, see, it should have our low and high side ranges and temperature. Okay, here's low. 27 to 42. Which we were. High 132 to 7, 176. Which we center. were. Center duck about 48. Okay, which we're yeah, we're a little little less than that. Right. A little less than that. But so far, it looks like everything is okay with this system, doesn't it? Well, I want everybody to make sure that you understand now. Again, these new systems contain a lot less refrigerant than before. Uh, I remember way, way back in the day, three, four pounds was not unusual. Now there are many vehicles on the market that use less than a pound. I've actually seen one uh, like 10, 11 ounces, I think was the, the smallest charge I've seen so far. And we're getting the handle, we have a question. So go ahead. And our question is, is the oil on 1234YF hygroscopic and what kind of oil is used in 1234YF? Uh, it is, Especially for 1234YF, and I'm pretty sure it is. Do you know for sure if the yeah, 1234 is hydroscopic? Yes. Yep. So, yes, you want to make sure that you only take it from a sealed container. And if you're only using a small amount, make sure you lock that back up. You don't want to leave it exposed. All right? So, thanks for that question. All right. So, so far, we've done like we did the first step with the 350. We did the um, test results. With the pressure gauge and the temperature, we compared them to the factory chart. It's telling us everything's okay, but we have still have a complaint from the customer saying, hey, you used to blow colder. So something may not be right. What do we do next step? Give me just one second to disconnect and change over here. And again, eye protection, as G pointed out. Especially with minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, Pete. Absolutely. You don't want this stuff in your eyeball. It'll crack like glass. Well, I'm going to hold this up where I connect it. Now, I'm sure that if, and I mean, thank goodness for Mitchell One and, of course, Snap-on for providing all the equipment today. We would have gotten this from our Snap-on friends had they were make these yet. But we did get permission. To highlight these, this is actually uh, something called the Mantooth. It's a Bluetooth pressure transducer and has a connected ability to connect a temperature, a contact thermometer to it. And it works on your phone or any Apple or, or um, Android device, tablet, whatever. And it's going to allow us to measure pressure, temperature, and some other neat stuff. So let me go ahead and hook that up and we'll show that to you. Yeah, that's really neat. This is, you know, something that you really want to get involved with because it definitely will help you. And, of course, there's always a bunch of great tools to buy, right? But if you want to be more exact on what you're doing, well, what better? All right, so I have these in place, and let me go get my phone and we'll pull that up so Pete while well, Pete's getting his uh, his phone there he's gonna pull up these great readings and you could do this on any tablet or anything it doesn't matter so now, here's generally, if you, if you can see that, this is what the screen or the app looks like. Good. Okay. Now, we haven't started anything up yet, so this is going to refresh when we when we do. But this is what it looks like. And I've got my low side and high side pressures. And look, that these are measured in absolute. 
Why do I need to know absolute? Because that's one of the coordinates for my enthalpy diagram. Whoop, there we go. Yeah, keep, it, keep it bright. There we go. And it's also going to tell me what the saturation temperature is. Remember the scale that we looked at on the mechanical or the manifold gauge? It's doing it there for me. It's doing all the calculations for me, giving me the superheat and subcool in the chart. All right. So let's go ahead and start the car up and see what we got. Okay, so now the car is going to pop on, and we're going to see Pete's phone light up. Oh, if I can squeeze in here. Question, good. Make sure your mic's on. The question is sealed, special type, same as 134. I think he means the O-rings for hoses and pipes. The yeah, they would be specific for the vehicle. So any O-rings or seals? that need to be lubricated, don't put them in dry, and never reuse any O-rings or seals. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if the uh, if the difference between 1234 or seals are I think they're probably so. I mean, we've ordered them even from the dealer, and they seem to be the same. All right, so we're just going to let this stabilize. I think now you can see the actual pressure readings that we got and how they corresponded to what we just had. Notice the temperature. Just uh, there we go. How's that? Say, so notice that the temperature You'll in like the evaporator is below freezing. And look at that. So right away, what's that going to indicate? Pete went yeah. over this. Did we see this a little sooner, a little not too long ago? That we, we see this kind of varying around a little bit. But we're kind of on the high side on that superheat. All right? So that's what we've got so far. We'll set that off to the side. Shut the motor down a little bit. So it is a real good way that maybe you wouldn't condemn, you know, a low charge or a high charge. Now you have a more exact science in doing that. What's nice, and I'm going to show this in picture so you can see even better. I'd rather probably do that better. If I choose, I can go down here and pick. If I can see that. I can choose. Um, let me show you get there. I can choose this enthalpy button and look what I got there. I got my chart. So we're going to go back up to our big screen here so you can see that a little better. Let's take a look and see what that told us. Yeah, we'll come back over to here for it. And we have a question. All right. Scott, can you use machine gauges instead of your hanging gauges? You can. The pressure gauge is going to be just as accurate. Problem is, they likely do not have the temperature coordinates for you. Now, you can pull up a, a pressure chart, temperature chart for the refrigerant sure. and do it and, and make that or get that reading for yourself. But if you want to fill out the charts, you need to know the temperature, not the pressure inside those uh, the condenser and the evaporator. All right. So here's our guinea pig. We did a baseline earlier. Again, pretty similar initial readings, but look at what this is telling us. The superheat number is way high. The subcooling, yeah, a little bit on the higher side, but not bad. Let's see if I can get, I don't know if I can zoom in. There. Can you zoom in on that a little bit there? And take a closer look at the actual chart. Now, again, this is something that this tool did for me. I didn't have to do the, do the graph. When we saw earlier, look how far over the superheat is. Remember what we're looking at there? When we have that refrigerant leaving the evaporator, what's going on? It's going on little liquid droplets, no heat load in it, cold, um, enters into the evaporator. It's going to start taking on the heat load from the hotter air around it. It's going to start to warm up. It's going to reach 
uh, its condensation point, and that's where it's going to go into its change of state. And that point is where it's going to be able to absorb the greatest heat load from the air in the cabin. Now, if we don't have enough in there, that's going to get done way too soon. As it continues to pass through the evaporator and being exposed to that hot cabin air, now it's going to increase in physical temperature, and that's what you see here in that high superheat. So when we see that higher than we should, we can suspect that there's not enough refrigerant flow for some reason through the evaporator. Again, there could be other causes. Undercharge was one. Maybe the metering device is not working properly, or maybe the airflow is not correct across the evaporator. Maybe there's some restriction to it. Maybe the evaporator cores are damaged. All of these could be a factor in that. All I know is that that's not quite the way we want it to be. Here's a temperature comparison between what we did earlier, 75.9 degrees outside, 44.2 on the inside. So that's roughly a 31, 32 degree difference. That's pretty darn good. But where is the air being measured? It's being measured out, outside here, outside the car. What am I really wanting to know? Is the air going into the evaporator? How cold is that? And that's going to knock several degrees off of that difference. All right. So what I want to do now, I suspect I have an undercharged condition. The best way to find out is let's do a recovery and we'll find out how much refrigerant's in the system. And for that, we're going to use this new Snap-on PolarTech recovery machine. Get the man teeth out of the way. Yep. And we'll get the hoses right here. Excuse my back. There you go. Now, some of you may already be familiar with the 1234 systems and their additional requirements. If not, though, we are certainly going to discuss that as we go because there is a very specific required procedure when dealing with these systems now here we're going to start off we got the machine turned on we got our gauges hooked up pressures are stable we're going to go through the automatic feature and let the machine do its thing now this machine is also certified for hybrid surface Pete, what's the difference between servicing a hybrid vehicle and a conventional one? Well, there are many hybrid vehicles that are using electric high voltage compressors. And they take a special non-conductive oil. If you get even the smallest amount of contamination with 134A or 1234YF oil into these systems, you could have a, a ground fault that's gonna keep the vehicle from even running. And if that happens, you're gonna be replacing every component in that system. So if you're gonna use the machine, if you have a machine that's certified that you can flush it out, make sure there's absolutely nothing from the last vehicle getting into that hybrid, then you wanna stay away from it. Or I think Mr. Trulia has something he can share with us that will even take that an extra step and protecting those hybrid vehicles from unwanted contamination. Yeah, you can use a filtering system from AirSep. You know, a lot of the hose flushing stuff is good, but when we're dealing with a compressor that can cost you the last one I replaced, $2,900. Wow. And then, of course, you have your receiver dryer and you have everything else. Special oil. So I would say you don't want an isolation fault that you would describe it. Any isolation fault will really give you an issue of either the AC system shutting down and or the whole vehicle shutting down, which would be pretty damn bad. And we got to remember, every car that's electrified, they're only going to have an electric compressor. You know, there are very few hybrids out there that use a belt. That would be some of your old IMA Hondas and some of the, uh, the older Ford Escapes and that. But most of the new ones are all electric compressors. And they could be AC volt, three-phase AC, or they can actually 
with a built-in inverter switch over the DC voltage. So they can either do either one and they're very expensive. So it's really good to make sure you have the proper training and the proper equipment. And again, with high voltage, it could be a shocking experience. Maybe the last shocking experience you'll have. Yeah. So we don't want anyone getting hurt. Maybe a good idea to check it out. I mean, so here you do have that option right there on the machine. You can pop on two. There you go. Right. So we'll just go ahead and select regular gasoline vehicle. And now we're going to indicate vacuum time, which in this case is a default of 25 minutes. And then how much charge we want the machine to add. This has a 0 0.550 kilogram specification, which is just going to be 550 grams. So we'll just plug that in. Hit and we enter. found that information in pro demand as well as Absolutely. the service label. Yep. And, and you want to make sure don't go by the service label under the hood. If the vehicle manufacturer has made a change for whatever reason to that specification, you got to look for that TSB that's going to let you know that. And you've heard Gene and I preach numerous times. Part of your service diagnostic process is to check those TSBs. So make sure you use that as your final determining factor. All right, so we're going to hit enter. This actually allows me to put in a tag number if I want to keep a permit record for that particular vehicle. We'll just bypass that for this right now. Vacuum time is set. Charge is set. We're all set to go. Hit enter. Now the machine will detail exactly what we need to do. It tells us to connect the lines, make sure that they're connected and open. And this part right here is super important to follow the prompt on the screen. And when they say open, it means screwing it down to open the connection. Yeah. Very, very important. So now we're all good, Pete. We can all hit good, the answer. Sir. Now, here's an important part. It is going through an automatic refrigerant identification phase. This is a requirement for machines certified for 1234YF. But as you heard G say earlier, this is something you should be doing on every vehicle that comes into your shop before you hook your machine up to it. And before that is the sealant test. Get your sealant te tester, not that much, and it will help you protect your equipment, which can cost you a whole heck of a lot more to have to fix or replace. So and it's ruining, go a, ruin, ruining a beautiful machine like this, Pete, would be a shame. You know, they don't really uh, guarantee it for someone not following the rules yep. right okay we have a question all right do you need to add oil when performing an evac and recharge does the machine automatically add oil during service that's a great question marty when you're doing a uh, evac and recharge you're actually losing very little if any oil especially in these newer systems many of the many of these systems now the oil is only in the compressor. We're not filling the entire system with it anymore. You know, it used to be that we have a lot of oil that would make its way to the evaporator, to the condenser, being carried along by the refrigerant. But the goal now is to keep it in the compressor and away from the rest of the system. Uh, if we're going to add any, uh, not unless I'm making a component replacement or if I see something collecting in my recovery and the machine, as you will see, is going to tell us exactly that. And you can see here we have 100%. 1234 YF, nothing else in there, and it had zero air. Zero air, very important. So now, after that, it's going to take the refrigerant in. But one thing I do want you to be aware of, on the drain bottle, you should always make sure you look at the machine, and you can see down here the bottle has nothing in it. I usually... Rather than remembering where it's at, I take a piece of painter's tape. Since this has nothing in it, we're not going to worry. But let's say I had some in it. I would put painter's tape, let's say, right on this moth right here. That way I could see how much I took out. Generally, very little comes out. So that's something that you want to do. Also, on maintenance on your machine. You should have a spare filter around, even though it's a new machine. 
You need oil and filter because all these machines will warn you. And then you know what will happen? It will shut the machine down. Super important. So please keep that in mind that that is something that could be an issue. So here you can see we're recovering. It's going to tell us the amount. We're going to be able to print some paperwork out that comes right out of the machine here. We had a bunch before, just to give you an idea. And these are very important, in my opinion, to give to the customer. What we do on our machine, we, do, we take that, we make a picture out of it, because a lot of times thermal paper will start to wear out or maybe the paper will get lost. So why not put it in the system? So you can see our gauges are going down. And as I said before, it's a very expensive refrigerant. You definitely don't want to have any leaks. We've been doing 1234 for quite a few years. And a lot of body shops bring us vehicles that they've replaced some parts on. Now, that being said, you know, before we started using something I'm going to show you, there was a bunch of problems with the body shop speed. They would say, well, I paid you for the refrigerant and it leaked out. You just told us to refill it. And there was nothing in it when we got it. We evacuated it. Okay. We did, you know, a long period of time, 35, 40 minutes. These new machines, the spec is if they can pump down to a certain amount, it may be five to 15 minutes. But it's good practice to do at least 25 minutes. Okay. I like to do 35 or 45. That way, water boils at 59 degrees Fahrenheit and any moisture in there, you can boil that out and hopefully make the system that much better. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. No oh, question. Well, he had it on the wrong spot, but um, the. Uh, there's a question about using nitrogen for leak testing. Okay. So I, I knew someone was going to bring nitrogen up. Well, this is not your father's yeah. Oldsmobile anymore or Saturn. Okay. I like saying this. Or Pontiac. They were all out of business. Your butt will be out of business. Now, nitrogen is good, but do you have a nitrogen test? No. So we're going to show you a better way to do it. Because these leaks are so small, the smaller molecule is CO2, chemical-wise. Okay, So if you put that in and you have a gas analyzer, you could find the leak. And guess what we're going to show you? A gas analyzer. Okay, So I could take my gas analyzer right here. A CO2 bottle down below, probably tough to see with this in a way. Let me move this out of the way. So we won't need that anymore. And I could hook this up with a special hose with all the refrigerant removed, Pete. Don't mix CO2 with the refrigerant. This is after you recover it. Put it in a vacuum for a little bit. We put 200 pounds of CO2 in. We take our gas analyzer here with a little hose, and we search the area for a leak. If you graph it and it comes up, you'll know what type of problem you have. Now, you would say, well, why not just do it with the 2913 leak detector? Well, that's mandatory, Pete, but I'm going to tell you the real deal. Not that easy to find. So this is another new tool out by Snap-on. You can check this out, the Snap-on gas analyzer. I made this hose up myself. Usually have a big 20-foot hose. Takes a little too long to actually suck it through to see what CO2 is. So we won't do that. Yeah. But let's go over to some slides over here while we're waiting for the recovery. Before G gets started, we got one question we're going to take in real quick. If during the ID it shows air, do you replace the receiver dryer during the evac service and recharge? I'm going to absolutely say I would because air's got moisture in it and you don't want to leave any moisture in the system. It's not like we're talking about gallons here. It takes very little to react with the oil and refrigerant One to cause that acid. One eye drop. 
Yeah, one eye drop. One very eye small. drop of moisture can do that. But that's a very good question. And again, this is why I like 35 to 45 minutes. Try to boil it out. Now, the real world is, Pete, we could suggest that. But what happens when you have, let me get this out here. You have a condenser like this, and here's our receiver dryer right in the bottom. Okay. So you can take this out. They do sell it. But does a customer want to go for all that money? Mm. So the call is, I would say, look, we're going to do the job right. We're going to write it down on the bill because air and 1234YF in this case, or 134A, hydrofluoric acid, it'll weigh, eat away at the inside out. Mm -hmm. Inside out. Absolutely. We'll come back to this in a minute. Question. Another, we have it up yeah. there. Yep. On a system with a compressor that has an oil separator, why add oil when changing the condenser? Well, because not all the oil is in that oil separator. I mean, it, it, you, I'm going to uh, kind of paraphrase this a little bit more. We always preach, read the factory service procedure and follow that procedure. If it's a compressor and all that was designed there, it may tell you. You don't have to add any oil to your compressor uh, or to your condenser or any component when you replace it. Others will give you a specific balancing procedure based on the component that you're replacing. So make that your guideline on whether you're going to use or add oil to the system. That's why RTFI, read the freaking information. Okay. <laughs> so we have our little measuring cups. We just had to get new ones because the other ones are getting so messed up. Plastics are, they don't break. And here's our little turkey base. And no, I didn't steal this from Doreen. And I'm not bringing it back <laughs> for Thanksgiving either. But what we do is we measure the oil out and by the way, even when you get a new compressor, some come with no oil, some come with oil. If they come with oil, we take the oil, measure it, then we will suck it up, and we will take this to put, let's say, right here in this condenser. If it says to put it in, we're going to go like this and slowly put it in because you're never going to get that oil injection that you're going to put in to make sure the oil resides here. It's not happening. Doesn't happen. Right. All right. So, you got any other questions? Uh, no. Any good questions? There was actually a chat one. I sent them over, okay. here, but it may not get here. Just so, yeah. so don't put that. Okay. Don't worry. Said, ask your question on the bottom of your chat box to go to the right box. Go yeah. to the right box. Like my wife says, just stay in your box. <laughs> put it in the right box. The the question was if it doesn't make it over to Q and A was. Yeah, he heard that the machine will not allow you to charge the system if there is a leak. Is that correct? Okay, again, another very good question. That's why we're going through the process with this machine. As G pointed out, 1234YF is expensive stuff, and it's also considered mildly flammable. So we want to make sure that we treat it with respect. One of the things that these new machines require you to do, of course, is identify what the refrigerant is before you bring it in. If it fails, it's going to put a block on you, and you're going to have to purge whatever it is that you just took into the lines and hoses into a special recovery tank for dirty or contaminated refrigerant. You'll have to dispose of that separately following, of course, EPA and your local and state guidelines. Now, if there is a leak detected, that's one of the steps it's going to take, and we'll show you that as it's going to come along. You know, if you've used 134A or even back in the R12 days, we used to vacuum the system down for about 30 minutes or so so that we could boil, as G said, boil the water out, get all the moisture out of the system before we put the new refrigerant in. In this case, it's going to go through that same vacuuming process, and then it's going to shut off, and it's going to look at how much of a decay or how much of that vacuum is lost over time. That's the first leak check this machine is going to perform. The next step is it's going to ask us to do the other half, and that's a pressure test. It's going to put in about 15% of the rated charge, and then where did you go? Where am I? Weak detector? Wait. The leak detector? Leak detector. You don't think you can bring it out here? Yeah, we did. I didn't have it. All right. Well, well, we'll show you that when we have to do that test. But here's what it's going to basically tell us is that we need to use a leak detector, a sniffer, 
that's rated to SAE J2913. And then we're going to set that at its highest sensitivity. We're going to place it in the car close to the evaporator as we can there in the lower footwell. We're not going to run the AC, but we are going to run the fan to get the air circulating through the HVAC case, looking for any sign of a leak inside the car. I can't stress enough that we do not want to leak inside the vehicle. You'll find, too, that evaporators for 1234YF system are specially certified. You must replace one that meets this certification. You cannot use a used one. And where does this come into play? Well, if you work in the body shop business, let's say the dash is all destroyed and the insurance company sends you a brand new dash with the HVAC case and all complete in it, you can't install that in that car without evaporator. It must be replaced with new. Why? Because any buildup of that refrigerant in the vehicle could be ignited by something as simple as an e-cigarette or even your phone, your cell phone going off. And that refrigerant not only being, you know, very flammable there, but there's a DOT and the SAE ratings, a Department of Transportation rating on that evaporator. So it's not just something that would be okay, okay? This is mandatory that you have a 2913. And we'll show you that detector. So Mitchell sometimes says, does not state oil quantity for each component. Well, if you look, sometimes, Scott, you got to look around. I mean, we use it, and uh, I haven't come across lately that that'd be the case. You got to look sometimes in different areas. Okay, with CO2 versus nitrogen usage, would you recommend using ultrasound leak detector? Now, ultrasound, I have a very expensive unit. It's nice, but it, sometimes with the noise in the shop, it could be very, very difficult to actually find that particular leak with sound. Ultrasound is great, but I'm telling you, CO2 is the way to go. I used to use nitrogen for years, but I don't have a nitrogen tester. Someone hit me up. I put a video up on uh, YouTube and Facebook, and someone from Australia hit me up and says, oh, you can use nitrogen. Well, how much is that nitrogen tester? And again, nitrogen or CO2, the smaller molecule is CO2, and you want to find the smallest leak. Let's go on with some real-world help, help is right here right now. So one PSI roughly equals one degree. You've seen that. And, of course, it's just the seat of the pants stuff here. With AC systems at rest, low and high side pressure should equal if there's no blockage. Now, here's what I want you to write down there. If you just ran the AC system, it ain't going to be equal. You have to let it go to actually stabilize the temperature. Okay? If it's running, it doesn't equalize. So always make sure it's equalized. 2913 sensitivity. Again, you should not be doing 1234YF in your shop without a 2913 leak detector. Why? The liability, the liability you have is enormous, okay? Because the last person to work on that vehicle, if there's, God forbid, ever a fire in there, well, guess what? You're going to be responsible for it. You're going to be responsible. So the leak detector sensitivity, you put it to its highest rating. It goes with the fan on low to the floor duct. And basically, it, it detects a leak down to 0.1 ounce or 3 grams a year. That is a very, very small leak, super small leak. Make sure only to install special hybrid slash electric oil. Now, these oils are super duper duper expensive super expensive now you got to put the right oil in like in MD10 I know we do a lot of Toyotas because Toyota has a lot of electric compressors that oil is not cheap it's not cheap at all okay so make sure you put the right stuff in only use an oil installer that has never had a PAG oil in it this is on an electric compressor why 
Remember we said one drop? It's all it takes. Can you use nitrogen to check for leaks? Well, we went over that. Okay. Yes, but it's not going to work as well. We found it. Okay. Now, how about a lot of people go, how about soapy bubbles? Soapy, smoky bubbles. What are you taking a bubble bath? You're not going to deal with the soapy bubbles. If it's a obvious leak, do you want to jerk around and lose $70 and have your customer yell at you? Yeah. 70 bucks a pound or better. So come on, we're professionals. You need the right equipment. And we're going to show you this 2913 in a second. Well, actually, you should show it here now. Yeah. Put it on the highest sensitivity. Yeah, it was, and it's interesting because when you talk about soap bubbles, that was okay in the R12 days when you had, again, like four pounds of refrigerant in there. We used to use the halon thing to look for the flame jam. Right, right. And now we're looking at, like you said on your screen, three grams a year leakage rate. That's nothing. That's 0.1 ounce a, over the over the course of a year. Good so we're looking for very it. small leaks here. Um, okay, so this is a, a, the new... J2913 snap on leak detector. They were kind enough to send to us. We're going to show you how it's used as part of the uh, recharge and evacuate process. But it's got some nice features to it. We're going to let it warm up here and then I can share those with you. Yeah, so as that's warming up, because it does have some neat stuff there, I'll continue on with a couple of things here. So we talked about $70 a pound. Use CO2. Okay, you can buy that big bottle that we showed you there before. You could buy the bottle in a gauge set probably under two, three hundred bucks and refilling. It's very inexpensive, about twenty nine dollars to fill that bottle up. Okay. Uh, all our twelve our twelve thirty four YF machines perform leak checks. One, a vacuum leak check. You may want to write this down. It's mandatory. Ten minutes. You're not going to skip it. Oh, I'll just blow by it. You can't blow by it. Right, Pete? Can't do it. And a pressure leak test. Now, pressure leak test, we know when the system's off, the pressure is higher on the low side, isn't it? This is why you can get away with what I'm going to tell you in a second here. This procedure is mandatory since it's checks for flammable refrigerant being released into the vehicle's interior. We went over the liability. You don't just buy the machine. All the snap-on dealers should also be selling you this 2913 leak detector. Okay, without this, your liability is enormous. Vanna White here, Vanna White thing to my side. Now, the R1234 YF charge during the leak check is only 15 percent. You say, Why? I'm going to tell you why, Pete. They don't want you blowing big money when this thing has a huge leak that you didn't find. The leak may not even be there. Can you see why you want to put 200 pounds of CO2? After you recovered the refrigerant, after you basically evacuated just a small period of time, you shut it off, you put the CO2 in it, then you say, well, what do I do with the CO2? Do I leave it in there? Absolutely not. You got to let it out very slowly. You put a rag, you open the valve a little bit. Opening means turning clockwise. You make sure you don't get a puddle of oil. If you open a full, you may blow oil out. Usually, we have not seen any oil come out on all the cars we did on 1234 YF. So we do it slowly. We don't have a problem. So after that total charge is there, it forces you to check for a leak in the evaporator. After the panel duct is selected to the floor panel, fan on low speed, no AC on, fan on low speed. Use the 2913 leak detector. Highest sensitivity, and you should leave it in there. We're not going to do this today. We're going to show you in there, but you should leave it in there about five minutes. If no leak is detected in five minutes, supposedly it's good. Now, here in my shop, we do, before that, we we put the CO2 on. We were doing a lot of body shops out of every 10 cars. Seven of them would leak. Now, when a body shop brings his car, maybe it took a front hit, obviously, right? Something went with the AC. They br put brand new components in, new seals. It'd always be some freaking thing leaking. And the body shop, I mentioned this earlier, they'd get mad at us in the beginning and go, hey, 
we paid you to charge us up. I said, yeah, you paid us to evacuate it, boil down any moisture that was in there, okay? And you paid us to charge it. Now we just tell them there's a mandatory $75 CO2 leak detector charge. If not, we don't even want to do it. And we tell all of our customers, if they got air in the system, Pete, guess what? They're low on refrigerant. And if they're low on refrigerant, they got air in the system. So we're going to check for a leak. Okay, you can yeah. check out some of my good YouTube videos that even see an evaporator leak with CO2. How do you get a certificate for uh, you got a email right. Pete? Yeah, <laughs> just email me. I will. I'll, I'll give you my email address here uh, near the end of the presentation if you don't already have it. And if you can't get me on email, just write us through Motor Age Magazine, hit the messenger on Facebook, or hit me on Facebook, or. I'm we'll not hard to get a hold GSP, of. We'll yeah, get we'll, it we'll, they can forward it to us. However, you signed up for the course. All right, next one. Will the leak ever produce an oily stain on a component area? And today's systems don't count on it. Nope. Maybe back in the old days when we had several ounces of oil in the system, that might be the case. But today, again, we're looking at very small oil charges typically contained in the compressor. So don't rely on looking for the oil stain okay, to find here's it. Here's your common. Honda, this was from a 1234YF. I just kind of used this in a class to show you how it dissipates heat. This, on old Hondas, you always had oil stains here. You can't find an oil stain on this. You can't. There's no way. And we see this all the time. What you need to do, no oil stain there or here. Okay, Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You CO2 it. Beep, 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 beep. Your detector is starting to go up. Guess what? You need to put a new condenser in. It. And if you think you're you're going to get away without doing that, you're going to be spending a lot of money on refrigerant. Yep. Some other tips too when you're doing your leak testing, guys, especially when you're looking for that very small leak, you got to have still air. You know, especially if you're hot down south in Florida, the shop's got all the fans blowing. You're going to have a difficult time trying to find that leak under the hood. So make sure you have nice, still air and take your time. Now, the new identifiers, you don't have to be quite so close or quite so slow as we did in days past, but you still have to take your time, keep it within, I believe the spec is like half a, half a millimeter or so right. uh, from the surface and moving at a certain specification or, uh, or rate through. Focus on the obvious too. Uh, very few joints in today's modern systems. So look there first. Uh, refrigerant is heavier, it falls. Right, so make sure you look there. In the evaporator case, the same way we're going to check for leaks for the system is the same way you can check any evaporator, for that matter, in the vehicle. Uh, just close the vehicle up, turn the plane on low, let your sniffer sit there, and see if it's going off. Oh, we have another question. Uh, would you recommend a micron gauge for assisting with vacuum levels instead of relying on only time? Today's machines, with I mean, there was a lot of big push on micron gauges gauge, yeah. a few years ago. Um, but today, when you're using the 1234 machines, that's all self-contained. You don't have there's not you have no control over that. It's going to pull it down to where it's going to where it's specified. It's got to meet that minimum level, like G said. I, I don't really. And see there's a J standard out. on the the machine with yes. the vacuum pump. Yes. So yeah, you don't really Mate, need that. Anymore. And it's only going to stay that way if you maintain it. Another beauty with these machines is this one will tell me when it's time to change the oil in the filter or it's going to lock me out and let me do anything until I perform that maintenance. So, right. Yeah. In fact, speaking of the machine, what's the machine doing right now, Pete, to give them an update? Yeah. Update. We are still about nine minutes into our vacuum down period. So we'll okay. continue along here. We want to say a little bit sure. Like I said, we were talking about this, this leak detector. I don't know if you can see the screen there. Okay. Yeah. She probably can come in on it. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah. this is this is pretty cool. I mean, first I could turn the, the audible alarms off or on with the little push of the button. I can set the sensitivity using the little button here, high. We're going to leave it on high for a later test. And here's something I thought was pretty cool about this one. Check this out. This thing has a graphing display on it. So if you're looking for that, if you're looking for that really small leak, there you, go. you can actually watch that graph. And when you start getting closer, you'll see it increase and it'll start to decrease when you pass it. So, so that's a that nice, that's a nice little feature. That's really nice. Visuals are great. Right. 
And of course, Great setup. Of course, on the end, we've got uh, the old UV bulbs to help look for that light, that dye detection. But let's and, talk, uh, regular let's talk there about for, dye. For dye comes in different spectrums. If you are using a dye that the black light is not compatible with, you may not see it. Yep. And you should wear the yellow glasses because it'll be more visible. Yep. Another and, question, Pierre? Sure. Here's another one. Does the gas raise or lower during a leak? Sniffer in the lower or upper location of the component. That's a great question. Yes, the gas is going is heavier than air. It's going to drop. But here's where you really got to know this, guys. As we mentioned, 1234 YF is mildly flammable. These cabinets are built above and beyond to ensure that there's not going to be a problem with leakage from these machines. But you know how they get beat in the real world. If you're in a shop where all your electrical outlets are at ground level, you may want to make sure that you do your 1234 YF service away from those areas just to be on the safe side. Because again, that refrigerator is going to go down and it could probably never, ever, ever, ever happen. But all it takes is once, right? Another question. How about the bullseye CO2 detection versus the snap-on gas analyzer? They're both CO2 detection devices. You know, uh, and I would say you could use either one. Exactly. You know, it's the same. It, yeah. I mean, now, granted, we are both friends with Bernie Thompson, the man who created the bullseye system. Great. And, and his main purpose for that was not AC. It was EVAP. All the trouble finding EVAP leaks. Again, because the CO2 is a smaller molecule. And I've seen my man here, G, find some really weird stuff using that when it came to EVAP. And then we just kind of, like anything else you give us technicians, we said, well, if it worked for that, it's going to work for this. So and we started it, trying it and everything. In fact, we just had it in that Porsche in there in the tire. Right. And yep. we had it in a Mercedes recently where the wheel was porous and they couldn't find the leak, but we found it with CO2. Yep. And in my air conditioning class a couple of weeks ago, we found not only two condensers bad, but we found an evaporator bad. But if you had the gas analyzer that you guys hate gas analyzers because you go, I don't have emissions, it is a great diagnostic tool. Absolutely. And if you have the diagnostic tool, the only thing I did to that snap-on gas analyzer is I took a piece of rubber hose rather than using the 20-foot hose. Yeah. You can use that. Why don't you want the 20-foot? Because you would have a long time for it to get there. Yeah. Could you use the bullseye? Of course you can. Best but suggestion? This is two and one. Best suggestion? Get them both. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea. And send one to me, will you? <laughs> All right. All right, moving on. So let's talk about the leakers. The leakers, you should be prepared as a professional. In fact, I just had to order more of these. New O-rings and gaskets. All of these. And if you don't have the socket to take these off, you need it. Caps. And you know what we do, too? We keep a Q-tip around because the little O-ring that is in the cap needs a little bit of oil on it. You know what happens sometimes? It sticks. And sometimes we've seen the O-ring go in to depress this, and that becomes yeah. a problem. You yeah. know, and we, then, I have a picture of one we didn't put in here, but I have a picture of a cap on a fitting actually leaking. And it shows it, in this case, with the bullseye foam, because we had a gas reading that was high. We had a CO2 reading. So... Check that out. That's what you need. Dad, Pete, I was going to cut you off there. Oh, no, no, no. Keep right on going. So there's the glasses. You need that. And you should be aware that there's this different spectrum lights. This, this particular light here does a lot of different dyes. The cork gun styles. Okay. And here's one that I use. And we keep them separate. This one is only for electric and hybrid compressors. It's mock. It's engraved in it. The magic marker that we have on it or the paint does wear off because you get oil on your hands. But we dry it off and relabel it because you don't want any of that in the system. Yeah. And I know that tonight, again, we were focusing on bringing you some new ideas in the diagnostics of AC systems. You guys are asking some great questions on some best practices and other methods or other things you need to be involved with when you're doing these uh, diagnostics and repairs, like leak checking. Now, I like dye. And you should know that the majority of vehicles coming off the line now already have dye in them. 
So you want to check for that before you start pumping more into it. And be careful that you don't overdose the system. Very if important. the guy before you puts them in and the guy before him puts them in and then you go in and put some more, that's no different than adding too much oil to your car's engine with the same kind of results. So yeah, make sure not that- good. Yeah. That's going to cause cooling problems. So too much oil, like everything is no good. Okay. Do you have the part number of that kit? What kit? I think you meant bullseye. The bullseye kit? No, uh, that's not for here. You can yeah. email us. Yeah, email us or check out their website. We can give you the snap-on number. Yeah, give you the snap-on part number. Let's Does see. the 1234 YF come with dye infused as an option? Uh, you mean the refrigerant itself? Not that I know of. Now, when you buy this, you know, here's we get the Honeywell stuff all the time. And they're 10 pound containers. So, first of all, your machine will identify this. You're going to need that little nipple here. Can you get in on that nipple, the brass looking thing? Obviously, it goes on a tank. There we go. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Good shot. Right there. Yeah, which came with our, our equipment. Yeah. So, right there. But yeah, there's um, no dye in that no dye. 10 pound can. Actually, no. he was asking about the kit with the valve cores and all of that. Oh, oh, I don't know. Email me because I just ordered it. <laughs> I read one every year. We go through a lot of it. I'm sorry. So right here, he's talking about this. Is we there special the dies for 1234 YF? Yes. Yeah. So our systems to make it so it's compatible with the oil and the refrigerant. That is okay. correct. So here is our hybrid setup. Here's our non-hybrid setup for 1234 YF. You see that they both go in. This has an end on it here on the low side. This is a squeeze type one, meaning you turn it and you see the little increments of how much oil slash dye you put in. And this thing you squeeze the trigger on. So your snap on dealer would have that or your regular tool supplier or a parts house. Make sure you get the right stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you this one. We have done quite, I do a lot of hybrid stuff. So we had ordered right from the dealer. A Lexus came in, it needed a compressor. We put the uh, the receiver dryer in and had it in the condenser, and we had to do an expansion valve on it. We asked the parts, this is Toyota parts or Lexus parts. They send us PAG oil. <laughs> Lucky we noticed it. I'm like, what the hell? Call them up. Oh, we use that all the time. I go, no, dude, I sent them a picture over. I said, here's the oil it tells us to put in. Please send me the right stuff. And if you do that all the time, you're going to have vehicles that their AC system's not working right. So you never know if they're lying to you or not. Yeah. Get to you. How do you feel about using 90% nitrogen and 5% hydrogen? Hydrogen? Look, hydrogen. How would you like <laughs> to, to put wine in there? You can do anything you want. The bottom line no. is what really works, okay? You know, if you have these special testers, you can do whatever you want. But I'm telling you, first of all, you know, in AC systems, you want to keep the system dry. Yes. Always balk at everything. You know, nitrogen was the one to use for years, but you don't have a detector. You were looking for big leaks. Today's vehicle doesn't push out a lot of oil. Okay, you usually don't see the dye. So you want something with the smallest molecule again. I'm not trying yeah. to sell you on CO2. When you blow 70 bucks, then you're going to start to see what you need to use. That's a bottom and, line. And, and with the ni nitrogen and hydrogen, they were used commonly, again, with those bigger systems. And we were using soap bubbles. To, yeah. To, uh, to, to and the hell the on flame. You're not going to, you're not going to, that's not going to work. If you got that bad leak, I mean, you're going to see that. You're going to know about that just through the space that we're doing now. You know, it's it's same thing with EVAP. I've, I've written this in Motor Age articles and stuff. When you hit the button, all your smoke machines have the button for five minutes. Right. Okay. Don't hit it more than twice because the oil will, the smoke will condense into oil. If it's a big leak, the smoke comes right out. It's the little ones that'll kill you. Okay. So do you want to waste a lot of time or a little time? Yeah. It's your decision. Not our decision. We're just telling you 
what works. If you stop by my shop here in Maypack, New York, 40 miles north of New York City, come check it out. We'll show you. We'll show you what works. So we got time left there, Pete. See, we got here six seconds. I'm not quite sure where we are. Oh, we are in the leak check phase. Ah, leak okay, check. Okay, so the machine two. has gone through its vacuum uh, pull down, and then it has gone through, and now it's doing its second test. It What it's doing now is it's doing a vacuum decay test. So we've got two five-minute total, 10-minute tests running. It has to be pulled down to a certain vacuum level before it will go into this test. If it can't do that, it's going to stop you right there saying there's a leak. I'm not charging nothing until you fix the leak. And this is helping you save money. Because, again, like you said, $70 a pound, that's a lot of money. Customers going to be screaming at you that Friday night when you want to go home. You ain't going home without being aggravated. All right. So any other questions that we got while we're waiting for the last few minutes of our... I went over test? the oil bottle on that. Yes. We could probably simulate, but now because we got to wait, oh, that'll be five minutes. You can talk about a couple of more of your slides if you want to knock that out of the way. I'd like to make yeah. a comment here. Jerry, yeah, you mentioned a couple on? of times the old R12 flame. You know what? People yeah, didn't... Mic on. Yes, my mic is on. <laughs> uh, you mentioned using the old flame detector back in the old days. What people didn't realize when they did that is when that flame changed color, that was phosgene gas, mustard gas, the same stuff that killed World War I soldiers. <laughs> it is poisonous and it is cumulative. You could get 80% of a dose today and 20% tomorrow and you're dead. Yeah. Now, so. you, know, you bring a good point up. When, and by the way, we should say, you do not retrofit 1234YF, let's say you think you want to be greener and you want to actually take a 134A vehicle and put 1234YF in it. Can't do it. This is not like the R12 days and always a well-ventilated area. Why? Well, 134A will rob the oxygen out of the air. And there was a case where they found three people dead because they were actually in a small area doing these conversions. And in real, they didn't realize it. It's just like being asphyxiated with CO, mm -hmm. right? You don't know unless you can kind of smell something. And a lot of times, you know, we got to think about our safety. Your family wants to see you come home safe. Yep. Well, maybe not everybody. Doreen sometimes says, please, don't come <laughs> home at all. But that's a whole other ball game, right? Okay, another question we got here from Adrian. Any special way to confirm where the vacuum is leaking from? That's a great question. Let's look at what we're doing here. We have recovered the refrigerant from this vehicle. Why would I be doing that? Well, I'm either getting ready to make a repair because it was undercharged and I need to fix the problem, which means I should have been doing my leak test already, or I'm going to pull it out so I can use that CO2 technique to find the leak. So it's really not a matter about use, finding a vacuum leak. I'm not going to look for a vacuum leak. What the vacuum de uh, decay is telling me is that maybe I didn't fix it yet because right. there's still a loss somewhere. And we're going to do two types, vacuum and pressure. Sometimes it'll leak under one condition and not leak under the other. So before I answer this question here, I do want to say with the vacuum uh, leak, just because it holds vacuum, and this is a thing that people don't get in the AC uh, area. Because it holds vacuum, vacuum and pressure are two different things. Don't be so confident that you have a good, a good vacuum hold and it ain't leaking. The other thing is always leave your machine in a vacuum. You know why? Lines could be loose on your machine and you wouldn't know it. But if I see my machine is in a vacuum, and I love these people that put the machine away at 134. You can't do it with these. But a 134A and it's pressure on the gauges. God forbid you don't have these. And you go connect that to a vehicle. And that line right there has a hole in it. And you just put this thing on with pressure. It'll come out and smack you right in the face, God forbid. Yeah. And that's a minus 15.4 degrees. Not as good as this minus 22 degree stuff. So now, well, actually, I, I, had, I had a question I accidentally archived already, but no the question problem. Was, I saw it. Yeah. Do I have a yeah, special you can, machine can for uh, hybrid or electric vehicles? No, but I have a special tool that I put in series with my machine from Aircept. 
Aircept has this special tool that basically gets plugged in. It burns the peg oil. Now, all my machines have hose flushing. Um, I've cut open my old hoses, okay, because we changed hoses last year on a machine. And even though we did hose flush, there was oil in the hose. So am I going to trust that on a system that says one eye drop? Just one. Okay. One little drop. I got to change all those components. I'll be buying a car. Yeah. No way. Yeah. So I say if you're going to do electric or hybrid vehicles, uh, check out Aircept. They have devices. I know they're on backwater now. A couple of my students just did a hybrid class, and a couple of guys now have to wait until they're, they're uh, building them. Yeah. Next question from Rick. Any advice on cleaning an evaporator with mold on it? Uh, well, you find that now, uh, in fact, this Camaro is a good example. They has what's called an afterblow feature for that exact reason. When the AC shut down, the blower will continue to operate to dry the condensation off of the evaporator to help minimize the chance of anything growing on it. That's another reason to keep your cabin air filters nice and clean. And so they've been we doing that for years now with yeah, the blower. And we don't want to give that that uh, that mold anything to feed on. But if it's already that way, there are several cleaning products on the market that you can use as an aerosol, introduce it into the ductwork to, to get it to the evaporator core, um, or maybe through a blower resistor or however else you can get it into the casing. You just follow the directions for that product that are supposed to help you uh, neutralize that mold and help you dislodge that cleaning There's off. even one, a uh, foam goes up the uh, tube, mm -hmm. the drain tube, but trying to find the drain tube on a lot of these cars. It can be a challenge oh, to get to it. Oh my God, yeah. they're tough. We yeah. use one that we put in the car with the fan on low. It's this little mist machine. Yes. Sir. And say, it yeah. works very well. Yeah, I can't remember right. the name of that, but yeah. We, I've heard we that wore it out. Um, U view, I believe. Yeah, U view is the one. Um, I think you're right. And it works great. In fact, it's up there. You see it on the thing? I got to get a part for it. It's right on top of that cabinet. <laughs> but it works good. And of course, you can charge for it, especially with COVID. Don't want the COVID. Been there, done that, right? Yeah, right. So, all right. Where are we all at? All right. We're that? getting minutes close left. there. We're on our second half, questions? about two minutes left to go. We're good for now. Then we're going to show you the in car with this so you know what to do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and we only have a couple of minutes before the machine's going to tell us to do what we need to do. But as we explained earlier, we're going to need a uh, sniffer that meets that 2913 standard. We're going to make sure we have it on high. And then we need to place it in the car. I can get it. We can turn the fan and turn the fan on low. And we're going to let it run there. So if we want to, if you actually want to, you actually want to show that one, just put it in there. I'm going to show. Okay. We're switching over. And where's all the little light? Pierre has I got it right here. Okay. While they're setting up, just uh, remember that, uh, you know, you may not be able to see everything, but when you're doing this test, the since the refrigerant is heavier than air, uh, you're really looking for the low spots in the cabin where that refrigerant might leak to. Can you see that in there? Okay, so you see where he has the, the silver tip I can see here. And right there's the there. detector. He's going to put the key on, air condition off. And you can see, follow up the black. You see what a throttle pedal is? He has it right up there. You can just leave it on accessory. Pete, you can kill the car. Yeah, I tried that. It didn't want to go. Hold the it. didn't want to go. Hold. Just keep holding it. It should come on. But he moved it. There, there you go. go. Yeah, GM's got to hold the button in. 
Well, he has to move. It only has. Let me get my. And I ain't jumping off. Let me get my old my old butt out there other way so you can see. Okay, so a fan should be on low inside the vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Now this would be what refrigerant it. We're kind of jumping this stuff. We didn't put anything. Yeah, in. the machine is just about set to go ahead and add that charge back. I think I heard it just now. Yeah, you heard it click. It's only going to add about 10, 15 percent, I believe, of the total charge quantity. 15 percent by law. Um, and that's going to require us to do what we're doing here. We should have the door closed. Again, close up the vehicle. Fans on low, uh, ducts to the floor, and we're going to let it sit here for like three minutes or five minutes, rather, at least, to give a chance for it to pick up anything. Now, we're not going to you know, wait that whole time now, so we'll show you the next steps on the on the tool. You can see with AC blower motor on low, AC is switched off, mode is set to floor, move to the next step. Place a 2913 compliant leak detector. Set the maximum sensitivity. That's four grams a year, which is nothing. Into the center of the floor uh, duct outlet as far as possible. So that's what we have back there. Now, after it's been sitting for five minutes, we go to the next step. It's going to ask us, was this test performed? Be honest. <laughs> don't, don't. Again, I can't stress this enough. This is a mildly flammable refrigerant, true. But if you set a vehicle out and get past this point to charge it, and it's got a leak in the evaporator case, who do you think they're going to come looking at if something happens? They're going to come see you because your shop and your name are the, on that repair order. So, And remember, someone like Mercedes-Benz, they thought it was so bad they haven't put it in their car, and they're basically paying a fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're still using 134A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So was this leak found or was a leak found? No. Is there an auxiliary evaporator? That's another great point. Don't forget if you're a lot of these SUVs have the evaporator core in the rear as well. So we need to check that one the same way we're checking the front one. In this case, we don't have one. So we'll hit no. And now it's going to go ahead and proceed with the charge. Behind you. Okay, so now you can see it's going in. See our pressures going up. And it goes in pretty rapidly. But how much are we putting in? Well, originally you only had the 15% of the charge, right? And now, now that we stated that there was no leak, the rest of the charge will go in. In this case, 0 0.550 kilograms, verified by checking in our service information, pro demand. Are you going to use the scan tool at any point of the diagnostic for this Camaro? Uh, we can, sure. We can take a look and pull it up and show you the PIDs on the screen. Take a look at the action of the variable compressor. We'll go ahead and get this part done, and we'll be glad to do that for you. Another question coming up. Yes. Got to notice, was the recovery value showing system low? Actually, at this point, it hasn't told us yet. But when this system is completed doing what it's doing, it will give us a print. We can print out the report that will tell us how much it recovered, how much it put in, what the pressures were, all the rest. Now, you know, the other thing that I found on a lot of new cars, I've done on a few of my own new cars and other cars that I've done for municipalities, I found that it's about two to four tenths of a pound low on all new vehicles. Yeah. It seems like the OEs want to save a little money. Yeah. Well, we got surprised with this one. Yeah. Maybe that was the exception, though. And yeah. we'll find out. So, so here, this is an important step right yeah, yeah. here. So when you look at this, you got to read the directions. It tells us, take off the red, unscrew it, right? It says, disconnect the high-pressure coupling, start the AC system, 
with the low coupling connected. What do you think it's doing? You're going to suck the hoses out. Yep. Now, sometimes 96-inch hoses may have a couple of ounces of refrigerant in them. Right. Hose. And if we want an accurate charge, you got to account do for that. Our older machines didn't make us do that. And to point out to what you said earlier about leaving your machine under pressure, if you hook that up to the vehicle and there's a refrigerant pressure higher in those hoses than it is in the vehicle, well, you just, you're counting that in terms of your recovery, and that's going to throw your, your numbers off. So we're going to start the vehicle up. I'm going to put the fan on. <laughs> Lucky it's you getting in that car. <laughs> And you can hear that. <clears throat> so we're going to hit enter. Gauge went right up. Let me know when it's all done. Now it's going to tell us. Okay, now it's going to tell me what to do here. It says disconnect the low pressure coupler. So I'm going to follow directions and do that. I'm going to put the service caps back on. A very important step to do. And boy, I can feel this is a cold system. You can leave that key on. You can leave that key on so we can do scan data. All right. And now you see the machine? It is actually pumping it down and recovering anything that's left in there and leaving the machine in a vacuum. If you ever come back to see that your machine is not in a vacuum, you may have a problem with a hose getting loose. Got a question? So it All says right. empty hose, hose pressure. All right. So a question is, I was trained that the main difference in the 134 and 1234 YF systems was the oil used in the system. I would not classify that as a main difference. Um, 1234 YF, again, as we said many times, is mildly flammable, so it does require different service procedures and precautions, which we pretty much covered here this evening. Um, also, we're going to talk about 1234 um, has similar but not exact characteristics in terms of uh, being able to cool like the 134 systems. In fact, uh, um, if you try to put one into the other, the 1234 and the 134 systems, uh, they won't cool at all, uh, as well at all. Um, what I really want to stress here with these systems is if you get on right now and Google adapters, for 1234 to 134, you'll find, or have no problem finding them. My concern and your concern as a professional technician or shop owner should be, what happens when that DIYer has gone out and put one or, uh, put 134 into that 1234 system, it didn't fix his problem, and now he brings it to your shop and he doesn't tell you what he did. So you wanna make sure that, again, you have to on these machines, you have to identify what you put in there and then what are you going to do if you find that it is indeed contaminated? What steps are you going to take? Do you know how you have to recover that in a separate machine? If you've got an old one laying around the shop, that's perfect for that. And then you can dispose of that contaminated refrigerant, again, in accordance with the laws and regulations in your area. Okay, so we're going to hit print. And we get a report, which is kind of nice. So you can see we have 100% purity test. The vacuum was 25 minutes. The uh, gas recovered. I think that says 55. Okay. And the charge was 550, 355. Yeah, 355. So that was grossly undercharged. Now, I already have the results, again, of a similar, uh, similar charge recharge. 
um, where we had that undercharged identified and, and recharged it with the proper amount. We redid the test. So let's kind of look at the last couple of slides we've got here on that. And I'll share those results with you because I want to see want you to see what the difference it made. Okay, now we have the correct charge installed. You see our pressures are not all that much different, but look at the difference in the superheat and subcool levels. Much, much different, all in the green and looking much, much better. And this is nice because it even gives us the diagram, excuse me, it even gives us the diagram and it'll show, and I'll show you in a moment the difference between those two. Remember we talked a bit about the scale and the gauges. I just want to show this to you to, to point that out. We measured 47.8 PSI, but that was absolute using the Bluetooth pressure transducers. So we'd have to deduct the barometric pressure in our area to get the PSI we'd see on our gauge. So let's just say roughly 14 PSI. That would bring us down to about 33, 34. Again, match it up to the gauge. And we see that the temperature gauge reading 33, 34 degrees lines up with our saturation temperature that is being calculated by this, this tool. Very nice feature. Again, there's a little close up of the new enthalpy chart with the correct charge installed. And look at the difference on the right side as compared to what we started off with. Again, not preaching that the enthalpy chart is the, is the only best all way to do it. It's another tool in the toolbox uh, and can just help you uh, do a lot of things. Like I said, again, if you're just doing this as a quick test of your customer's system to make sure they don't have a problem going into the hot summer I, weather. You know, Pete, I think it's good when something is questionable, but for years, you know, little things like this right here, mm -hmm. I've been able to diagnose and like what? it's the same right thing it's okay. so here's what we use for temperature now again <laughs> you got to feel your comf comfort level i mean that chart is way better <laughs> than than that but hey i fixed many a cars with that Absolutely. i don't i don't have that set up but it's it really is nice do i want to get it you bet your butt yeah. Again, it's just it's just like anything else. It's one more tool in your toolbox. Definitely. What we can see is the temperature difference between 80 degree ambient and now a 43 degree at the duct. So we got that extra cooling power by making sure that we had sufficient. And that's really, I guess, what I want to want to push here. We have the correct amount of refrigerant in the system, so it can do its maximum job of pulling that heat load out without leaving any liquid left over to go to the compressor or uh, any gas left out of the condenser to get into the expansion valve. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and do some uh, scan tool because we were asked and when it's kind of like after hours uh, bonus stuff, Two. I do wanna hit this one more time. Go back to, I'm sorry, go back to one for one moment. We just finish this up real quick. Okay. Here's just a few things I want you to consider and you might drop some questions while we're playing with the scan tool. Number one, performance test, that'll be charged as a routine maintenance item, like I said. If you take the time or have the ability to fill this out quick when you're doing that that service for your customer, uh, maybe you can spot a problem and, and uh, get some extra work in or at least help them uh, be comfortable during those hot summer months. Another thing I want to throw in real quick so we don't forget it, if you're not Section 609 certified, get certified. It's required. And even if you are, consider recertifying because there's a lot of new information, best practices associated with 1234YF that is included in the new test and it's a proctor test you know you it, it's you can't no, I you just know, you have to work hard them, to i just it. used them in my air conditioning class and yeah. there's a lot of good information in the new max book the update yeah yeah and i'm going to throw this one out for you just so you have something to talk about at lunch tomorrow or monday i should say have you ever considered servicing the receiver dryer every two years as a routine maintenance item for your customer you're not going to find that in the service information in the U.S. Uh, vehicles, but it's a common practice in Europe and other countries because desiccant doesn't last forever, typically two years. So we got a vehicle that's been around for five years. That desiccant is probably taking in as much moisture as it can. And that's the theory. Keep it changed. Keep it fresh. 
help your system last longer, avoid those acid deposits, the future but leaks. That's, that's where people have the driving machine that Pierre used to work on. It's a machine that people take care of. Here, people drive them till they die. Yep. That would be a tough sell for a customer. But we do that with moisture in the system. We put the identifier on it and we go, hey, you got moisture. We need to check the system out. Yeah. You need to recover it, boil it down, and then you could kind of sell it. Yeah. And I'm going to stress that this is really based on what's going to be um, of value to the customer. Some of these replacing these dryers could be a lot of money. And oh, yeah. certainly then it's not worth it. Matt says, is the government allowing D DIY installers to do 1234? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Two pounds they can get. Anything anything more than two pounds, you have to be a professional. Now, why that is, it's another really hole in the system in my personal opinion. Okay. I think it's uh, a crime if they don't want people venting stuff to the atmosphere. You can't get everything in from a can. And these people don't they don't even have the training for it. But no. because it's the rule, they can go to any parts store and they can purchase up to two pounds. Okay. Yeah. Even though the car, most of them, lucky they take about a pound or a little more. And but I think that's unfortunate. And I think too that in, I know at least in California, if not other states, that they are required to leave a deposit, you know, when they purchase that little can and it's a self sealing can. And they have to return it back to the parts house in order to get their deposit back. So they they had, there are, they took some steps to combat this, but I'm not yeah, too you concerned know what about. A good step would have been not selling it, not sell to in the first. I 100 percent agree because you know maybe they got the cans not leaking, but when they emptied out their system so they could replace that leaking line, that just went straight to the air. Yeah, right. Well, so, it's always a political game. Someone's yeah. going to scream on the other side that they didn't get. You know they're right because you know a mechanic is gonna rip them off as they would say yeah you know these are all the good guys here yeah besides that you know what pete talks about uh if they're emptying it out to replace the leaking line they they didn't evacuate it they didn't leak check it they didn't do oh, any no. of that stuff no. they no. almost guaranteed oh, oh, to fail did they, did they have the 29 13 no but yet no. we could get in trouble don't and, get me and, going we'll be here and again I, you take these folks you know, of course, you, you guys know that Motor H TNC both we have YouTube channels and we've been putting content content up for years. And there's a lot of some maybe some of you watching that that have one and, and play with sharing your knowledge with the with the public. And I got no problems with that. But if you've done that or looked at that, oh my God, there's so much misinformation out there that people are just just eating up and falling for because they don't know any well, better. It's on the internet. It's real. Absolutely it's true. true. I've seen professional mechanics, or at least they claim to be, showing people how to put the computer spray, the dust off yep. into their into their cars. I and mean, it's, it's R152A, which according to the EPA is on that, that acceptable list, but it's not acceptable for use in any system that's on the road. Okay, question from Ezra. There's a specific range of airflow using the anemometer that can be used across all vehicles or vehicle specific. Love this tool. That anything I, under 10 miles an hour, okay. You know, and of course, the standard cubic feet per minute, I think, is a thousand is normal. Anything under it is bad. I go by miles an hour. Anything under 10 kind of sticks in my head as a problem. Usually, my new truck is like over 18 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So, this is a quick little check. You just put this doohickey right in here. And you put this puppy on, put the button on. Yeah, this, by the way, could be a huge money maker if I can get the right thing in the right hole. Okay. And there we go. So you put this on, it tells you the temperature in here is actually 73 degrees. And my air conditioned system is only, oh, it's blowing at 18 miles plus an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. No wonder why we're cold. <laughs> I'd rather be cold than hot. So this is a little thing that's really pretty neat. All right. Get well, it. we want to kind of start bringing things to a wrap up, but we were asked to take a look at some scan tool data. So we're going to do that real quick. Just give you an idea. Um, if you're depending on your scan tool. Oh. oh, let me zoom out here. Okay, we're still on the car, so we're good there. 
And while Jay's setting that up, of course, the very, very first thing I would ever want to do when I hook up my scan tool, especially if I'm going in enhanced mode, is I want to do a full system scan. Remember what we found on the Audi with the code set for the research door? A few other communications issues. I'm going to do a full scan. Not necessarily because it might leave me just the air conditioning you know, problem, but it will help me make sure that there are anything or is there anything else going on my customer needs to know about. And I can yep. advise them accordingly. So we'll and, go ahead. And, and here we go. Code scan. Now, that's a good point. You guys already saw that, that pre-post scan. Just a quick comment on that. If you're not familiar with it, that's more a collision requirement than it is for us because the insurance company, when the car comes in all beat up and wrecked and you can do a, a scan on it before your repair to find out what for sure is wrong uh, and what might be hiding that you didn't know about. And then the post scan is to make sure that you fixed it all and you don't send it back to the customer with something, another new problem or something you forgot because the insurance company doesn't want you to come back and dip into their pockets again. So that's really the reason we do that. But it's not a bad idea when you think about it to do it here in your shop. Yeah. Do it every car your customer comes in. So Keep it with as, them. As we're going through this, there's 10 codes on brakes. I think that's because Pete drives like a madman, but that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> we would want to look, you know, for HVAC codes. We have nothing. Okay. And, of course, we save all these and print them out to the customer. You can email them. So, and here's one of the good things here. As far as the engine side, we got all our monitors ready. Very important, so a code would pop up. Now, let's go into the HVAC system real quick. Here's HVAC. Let's look if there's any codes. We already know there are no codes. And hopefully they can see this good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it looks pretty Here's good. Here's sensor data. So here you have ambient air temperature, 73 degrees. There was our temperature out of the duct, and you guys all know, you know, you could graph stuff, which is great. High side pressure. Yeah, but this, this is a good place to go when you're, when you're doing your review to look for any of these PIDs that just stand out as being out of whack. Like if you're looking at a lot of these temperature sensors and the vehicle's been sitting in the shop and it's had a chance to, to, to uh, acclimate, and all these temperature sensors should read pretty close to one another. And look at this. Passenger compartment humidity sensor. GM has been using humidity sensors, even in their mass airflow sensor, like on the car here, an eight-wire sensor. They, they're looking at windshield temperature and inside temperature. Pretty neat, right? Pretty neat. So there's some good stuff there. Let's see some other data. So battery voltage is always something you want to see. Blower speed, ignition, rear defroster status, indicator. So is it seeing the request? Now, there's another thing right here. Very important. AC request. Well, you may have the button pressed, but if the computer don't see it, it ain't going on, right? right. It's not going to go on. And when you're dealing with these uh, climate uh, uh, control, uh, automatic climate control systems, um, you want to know that the inputs the driver's putting in are being are seen by the control module, and you just check your data PIDs, uh, uh, um, hit those buttons, and look for the state on the PID list to change. And right here, you got your recirc recirculation door counts. You can do that. You probably can get into bidirectional test here. So you just save that screen. And here, AC permission data. Now, this is important because if the clutch is inhibited, all right, if you have anything here that is going to prevent it from going on, it's going to be right up there in data. So it would be a very good idea if you go in there. Face, face, face plate data. <laughs> How to get that out of the mouth, right? So we can tell you here if the button's on, if something's active, not active. Real yeah. important information. Let's show them that, bud. Yeah, yeah. Let me Let's... hit some buttons and see if we can see the change of states. Yeah, you be the button man. All right, first one. Yeah. 
There you go. Active, inactive. AC switch. Do that again. I'll, I'll graph it here. And you see, you see that going on and off? Okay. That is the way to go. All right. We have a question here about your tax return, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, can you give us the name of the diagnostic uh, tool and the software? This is the Snap on Zeus that we're looking at. And it's the latest software version that they have out. Um, uh, this is 2021, uh, first quarter, I guess. Yeah. Now, and security the, and the code. I got to give props because usually you don't see something coming out. I mean, a 2020 model car and having access to this kind of data, you know, while technically it's still under factory warranty. And, right. And look at all this stuff. Security yeah. code accepted, security lockout, security program encounter, a lot of stuff. And, and thinking about program information. If you don't have a J2534 and you don't have a NASTF license, you should go to nastf.org and take a look at that. Yep. And module information, very important here. This would be mode nine because here is the vehicle identification number. And if this is wrong, this could be a major issue. Okay. You could see if there's any update. You could check that against the GM website. And if you had to program something, you could. So all important information and Snap-on seem to have done a very good job here on this particular car. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it did allow bi-directional control. This car, like I said, is equipped with the, the internal heat exchanger. It's also equipped with a variable compressor. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, guys and gals, the variable compressor allows the computer to uh, change the uh, the displacement of the compressor to minimize the drain on the rest of the engine. In other words, let's have just enough refrigerant circulating through the system to meet the demands at the time. And the computer's in charge of that. Now, typically, when we go into our test mode and we have it set at low, max, cool, it's going to default to that 100% displacement so we can get our pressure readings. But if you're taking a test and you have the control set in automatic mode, it's at a temperature that's very close to the temperature of the cabin, you may see your pressures drastically different. In fact, they may be very close to one another because there's very little compression being produced by that variable compressor. If you don't have the ability to bi-directional control in your scan tool, there are tools available from a number of manufacturers that will allow you to actually disconnect the compressor, plug in with the tool, and then manually adjust the displacement yourself so that you can properly test the compressor. Now, what we have here is a couple of service relearns. Re replace and relearn uh, HVAC actu actuator, replace and reset ambient air temperature sensor, and replace and re replace a blower motor. So you use relearns that you are not aware of, just like changing an oxygen sensor, yep. there's a relearn. Now, they did not have in here yet, and it's a new car, in all fairness to them, there is no bi-directional in HVAC. Now, maybe in the body module. Let me go in there just for the hell of it. No, I saw something on testing the variable compressor in there um, earlier, but I don't know if it was a bi-directional or just uh, graphing the operation while you manipulated it. I didn't see it. These are the only two here. But yeah, no, they were, yeah, one of those two. But anyway, like I said, I'm not sure it was, it was at, uh, out there. So I guess that should take care of, unless you have any specific questions, those of you who are watching, on uh, any more with the scan tool. Uh, again, it's a very valuable tool. It's part of your AC diagnostics now. You saw here too many relearns when you replace a component. As I talked about earlier, with that Audi flat motor being an electronic control module and a CAN network for crying out loud. Welcome to the future. Um, we just recently uh, did a I class. Us back to the future. No, going right into it, buddy. Full speed ahead. You know, but uh, GM is a great example because, I mean, the 2020 Cadillac, they came out with this whole new electronic architecture. Um, I mean, it's able to move four terabytes of data an hour and pass information on an ethnet system up to 10 gigs a second. Yeah. My home internet isn't anywhere near that fast. So here we go. We have a question. Uh, is DVOM AC Hertz and duty cycle readings a good test for variable compressor valve driving control? 
not AC. This is a pulse width PCM modulated circuit. It's going to be DC, but but he could do frequency. But you could do the frequency test, yeah. but it would have to be a DC. Yeah. But yeah, not not a bad bad question. No doubt. Okay, could you post your emails? I tell you what. Um, Type them in here if you can. Uh, won't be on there. You have to put it in the chat side. But uh, yeah, you know we can put it in there. So put Pete's in first. Oh, here you go. It's uh, P Meyer, one word. At or I can put it in for you real quick. It just make it easy for him. Yep. At E N D E A V O R B and the number two. Or too fast. Yes. B E A. Oh, sorry. B E A. V O R. You know what V O R is, brother? I do. B number two B. Dot com. And then you put mine in, Pierre. GT at TST Seminars dot org. Well, it's just so much simpler, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I don't have that other. Junk in it. <laughs> hey, I didn't rejoice over that one. So, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, something we didn't hit up, or you want some information from G on some of the equipment that he shared with you and sources for uh, things that you've asked about earlier, please has, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, that's what we're here for. You know, as we've said in multiple webinars and multiple times together, the number one reason for us coming to uh, and doing these webinars every few months is to help you make a better living for you and your family. That's the bottom line, whatever we can do to help you in that. So, and all the snap-on stuff, check with your snap-on dealer. I yep. know my snap-on dealer has all the stuff that they can get to you. And so, don't forget our, our sponsors, Mitchell One. Mitchell One. www.mitchellone.com. Thank you, Thanks Mitchell you so much to the folks at Mitchell One for Thank sponsoring you. tonight. And I guess we're about done and out of it's here. It's good to see you. Yeah, so thank you all. Have a great evening. And don't forget, we'll see you again in August. That's right. We'll Stay be back. Tuned. We'll be back. The boys are back in town. Mm -hmm.